Okay, um, welcome. Welcome to a joint um, public meeting between the House Human Services Committee and the House General and Housing Committee. Um, we are happy to be here today with uh, individuals who are going to um, help us understand the depth Somebody's watching YouTube. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Um, so uh, today we're going to hear about uh, essentially what it is that would be necessary for for us to really make a dent in the. Uh, I'll use the administration's language, unit generation for um, availability for people of very low income. Um, so people who are essentially living on SSI, SSDI, or very modest incomes. Um, so we are happy to have a number of people here today. And we're going to start off with Chris Donnelly from Champlain Housing Trust. I think it might take too long. I think everybody, is everybody in the room familiar with both of our committees pretty much? Yeah, I, th I think we're good. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, have you, yes, you have signed in, so you're able to share your screen. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Chris Donnelly. I'm with the Champlain Housing Trust. Um, and I really appreciate uh, being here today with both of the committees um, and that you're coming together to collaborate um, um, solving our housing and homelessness challenges in the state. But, um, I very much appreciate it. Um, I also, I, I, I really valued the time I was able to spend with the Human, Res or Human Services Committee last week. And uh, some of the feedback I received afterwards was very gratifying as well. And, um, uh, so I thank you for, um, for that. And what I heard was that you thought that I, I gave you some hope. And um, uh, that's uh, what I want to come to you today and, and hopefully give you a little more, more hope. Hey, Chris, uh, can I just interrupt for a moment? Um, how would you prefer to take questions? Uh, at the end of your presentation, would that be easiest for you? Mostly, yes. You know, people are, I'm going to be going through a series of um, uh, numbers and spreadsheets, and it's always a danger doing math in public. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to warn you, but um, uh, I also, um, so if you're confused or if I'm just going too fast or you don't follow my logic, I, I'd be fine to take a question in the middle, but what I'd rather do is if you have questions about the specific numbers, to wait until the end and we can kind of have that conversation. Thank you. Yeah. You can adhere to that. That would be great because that's um, part of asking questions with numbers is the tangents that can go off on those. Um, <laughs> So yeah, if we can just make copious notes and, and ask Chris when he's when done. Yes. Okay. And people will find this on the presentation on uh, both of our committee pages. So if you want to look on a little bit closer. I, I will put it up on the screen. And what I recommend, you can do what you want, of course. But what I recommend is I'm going to walk you through screen by screen by screen. And it'll um, create a narrative for you as I as I kind of go through that. So it'll be up on the screen. and. In just just a second. I normally, when I come to you, I normally have pictures of buildings or people with inspirational quotes. This one is so much different. <laughs> um, so um, when I was here, uh, when I was with the uh, uh, Human Services Committee last week, I asked you to take um, a look back ten years, and um, we started with talking about how the Champlain Housing Trust had stepped in and purchased Harbor Place in Shelburne at a moment where uh, we were spending a lot of money on motels. We weren't sure if people were any better off. And we said, maybe we have a better way. And so we purchased a motel and that was 10 years, 10 years ago. And then we did a, a series of, of other um, types of interventions in the ensuing years. Today, what I want to um, show um, you is um, what 10 years from now may look like. So I've done some, um, some modeling. I'll share the screen and we can start to walk through it. 
And I, I will say that anybody who's going to be coming up after Chris, if you plan to share your screen, if you would uh, make sure to sign into the meeting before you get up there, and um, that would be helpful. So this is um, uh, back in December. I, uh, our organization is a member of the, uh, the, home, uh, the Housing and Homelessness Alliance of Vermont. It's a coalition of both homeless and housing organizations, obviously. Um, we, um, we came to uh, some leaders, um, uh, some committee chairs, uh, both in the House and the Senate, with our legislative priorities. And we said, here's what we think we should be doing um, uh, this coming year. And we, um, we got challenged. Um, I'll be, be frank, we were told, um, what is this going to buy us? You, you're asking for a lot of money. It's a tough budget year. What is this gonna, it's gonna buy us? Um, how, um, do you have a long-term vision? Are we gonna be moving people out of motels with this money? What, what's your plan? And so we took that to heart and I raised my hand and went back and I've been talking to people for the last um, month and a half or so to um, help develop a model that hopefully is a framework for you to, to think about um, what the next 10 years might look like. Um, oops. So again, I wanna, um, this is a framework. It's not necessarily, a, um, it's not a housing needs assessment. This is not based on, we need 6,000 homes um, of this type or 2,000 homes of this type in the next 10 years. This is just a framework um, that I've used. I've assembled about 18 different um, data points and variables put into, um, uh, these spreadsheets to uh, uh, explain to you or show to you what we can what we can accomplish with the resources. Um, it's based on structurally. It's based on what the affordable housing network can um, uh, what the capacity of the affordable housing network is to move capital. And we have been um, um, blessed and uh, appreciative of the support that the legislature has offered us in the last several years, between 110 and 150 million per year, the last three years in capital to develop new housing. Um, this, this model um, uh, suggests continuing that level of investment. And I work, I work through um, what that looks like in terms of the number of homes being created, who may be created for, um, so forth. We um, I focus on the early years of this 10 year model and really addressing what the what Chair uh, Wood suggested, and that's uh, really focused in on moving people out of motels of people of the lowest income, and really trying to identify some new initiatives to uh, uh, address those needs right away. Um, but I do want to say that I feel it's critical that we can't just do one or two things. We need to do the whole housing system is is just not working for people. Um, so I think we need to take a holistic approach to do this. Uh, this modeling that I did uh, suggests that we could create 7,500 homes over 10 years, 300 shelter beds or some other types of um, service enriched um, uh, beds, and it will cost about 200 million per year. Um, my, I'm gonna try not to have my advocates hat on too much today, but I will say that I think the biggest risk we can take is not acting. I think that I don't think that should be on the table. I think we need to act, and that's going to be more than just uh, permit reform, more than um, Act Two Fifty reform. I think we're going to need resources to really address the needs of low and moderate income people. So this is the framework that I've, I've used. I'm going to go to the next slide. It's going to oops, um, is that too small? It is small. Yes. yes. Uh, let me see if I can. <laughs> Uh, or enlarge it here. It's all good. On the bottom, if it's a PDF, it's going to be over where the arrow is. Yeah, my, oh, I That's where your box is. Yeah, there we go. Better? More? A little more if you can. That's better. All right. So, oh, just get rid of the mic. Thank you to the Human Services Technology Team. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you can see my screen. Yeah. <laughs> right here, right? Okay, sorry about that. So I am gonna bring you through um, a series of numbers. What I mentioned just a bit ago is that um, early investments uh, in this model um, get at some of the, the needs of the lowest income uh, Vermonters um, and really kind of move some people out of, out of the motels, but they need 
just not an apartment. They need something a little, a little bit different. Um, so uh, permanent supportive housing is housing with uh, services embedded in it. Um, we uh, are suggesting that we do 200 of those over the next two to three years. Um, we, um, uh, there's been suggestions for, for new shelter beds, so non-congregate shelter beds, 200 of those. And then um, with the work, um, hopefully with collaboration with the Agency of Human Services, this is other type of specialized service bed or medical respite or something that doesn't quite exist right now. Uh, we need about 100 of them. And I think you've probably heard Paul Dragon talk about the just the, the lack of ability for his staff to cope with um, a lot of the needs of the people that they're serving. And so we need something a little bit specialist. It's somewhere between a motel and inpatient or um, nursing home. So those are really the priority new initiatives, and you'll see these flow throughout my, my modeling in the next few pages. Um, down below, as we're doing that really kind of initial targeted investment, um, we also need to be um, investing in affordable housing for the network and for the, uh, for the, for the communities. And so this is just a 40,000 foot level of what the next pages are gonna show you. And that with investment, this 200 million, uh, that's both capital and services. We will create an average of close to 400 um, apartments or farm worker housing or manufactured homes per year. We'll invest in home ownership so there's mobility. Um, uh, the VHIP program has been successful at a lower cost. And then there's manufactured homes. Um, Chris? So, yes. I, I'm sorry, but I, I know that people are wondering why the red at the top. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Doesn't, it says oh, total over 10 years and... Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll I'll explain that. So I just the, the red I I um, these are these are created in the first couple of years. Um, so the, the it's just the same number in the second column, um, but I I made them red so that when we go into some of the next pages, you'll be able to track them. Um, so that's not the total over ten. Two hundred is not the total over ten years. Two hundred will be the total in the next three years. Right. Just and it'll be it'll be over. I mean, it's three years is within the ten years. So um, it's a front loaded effort. It's a front loaded, right? front loaded effort. You're going to do those first, and you're going to have an annual goal for the numbers down below. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank oh, you. Yeah, sorry, thank. Uh, um, good friends on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Representative. <laughs> and when we get deeper in this, I may need I need may need to phone over. <laughs> I, I have been I've been looking at these these sheets for a few weeks and I've been talking to people about this so um, I may um, I, I may get a little lost in some of the uh, the details so I apologize but certainly questions like that please please drop so the the numbers down below are um, a result of investing in the in the housing um, the housing programs that we have existing but it's new new funding for those programs and will generate um, roughly. Um, with the permanent supportive housing that's above, those are, those are permanent apartments and the, and the numbers down below, about 7,500 homes total over 10 years. Okay, follow me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Okay, the next page, this is where um, I will, I'm gonna go back to the first page. When we take, this is a 40,000 foot level, these numbers. The next page breaks it out per fiscal year, okay? So this gets a little deeper in to show you a little bit more detail. Fiscal year uh, 24, the one that we're in, is gray on this because that's the year that we're in. We're not gonna fund. We're not gonna ask you for appropriations for this, this year for these. So these are, these are uh, an estimate of what's coming online this year. So I just wanted to show you that we have actually been, we have the capacity to do this kind of, um, uh, move this, this kind of money and, and develop this kind of housing in the network right now. This is what we're doing. When we look out to fiscal year um, 25 through uh, 30, uh, 34, those are, that's a 10 year period. But I, I put in, in this kind of plum or purplish color, fiscal year 35, that's, a, that's year 11 in my modeling. Because when we put money in the system, it usually takes 12 or 18 months for the housing to come online. And so I just I showed that in there because the money will be supporting those. But really thinking about those 10 years. Let me move back over. Um, so these are the these are just broad categories 
of, of housing that we're creating on the top. These are per it's permanent housing. You'll see, as I mentioned before, that the red permanent support housing is there. I just wanted to link back to these. Are, this is one of those new initiatives. And then down below, these are beds that are being created. Again, non congregate shelter beds. And uh, this kind of medical respite specialized relief bed that's a newer, newer thing. Um, and um, put them in into the, the next couple of years. One of the things that I want to caution um, uh, people about is trying to go too fast uh, because I think it will stress, stress the system. I know we have urgency and, and I have not a lot of patience sometimes. So I'm not a very patient person. Um, but um, I do think we need to do this in a methodical, intentional way um, if we want to have success. Yes. Okay, with this sheet, this makes sense? Okay, thanks. The next sheet that I'm going to bring you to is actually how these numbers, these to this total unit generation, total, I don't like that word either, but this, the total uh, number of homes that we're developing, um, how they are um, used or resource, how they're resourced for people that are experiencing homelessness. Okay. So what I have, take a look at, let me just show you um, and as, as an example, fiscal year um, 25 on the rental line where it says 377. People see that? Mm -hmm. I go to the next page. Um, new construction. 25% of new construction we dedicate to people coming out of homelessness. So 25% of 377 is 94. That's in fiscal year 25. Got that? So those numbers go across. Those numbers track um, from page to page. The next line down is the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, known as VHIP. This is that rental rehab program where Landlords may have um, vacant homes or not up to code, so forth. We provide um, funding for them to bring them up uh, to code. Historically, this program has served 100% or close to 100% of people through the coordinated entry program or exiting homelessness. That program is shifting this year to have two different options for property owners. They can either take a five-year grant, and I'm sure other witnesses will talk about this later, five-year grant, and they will have to take someone out of coordinated entry or a 10 year forgivable loan that they just have to set the rate, uh, the market, or uh, the rent at the fair market rent. And they don't necessarily have to bring someone out of coordinated entry. They can if they want. So this number here, this 50% target of those, of those um, apartments being uh, rehab is a guess. It's, it's, we don't know. The program hasn't hasn't actually hasn't actually launched. So that's a, a target. And that's so that's a conversation I'm sure you all can have um, with the department, and you can bring others into. Um, these last three here, I sh you can see the numbers are in red. Also track back to how I, um, uh, those are those new initiatives, and so these are both housing and and uh, high need higher needs beds. Um, so that middle line where it says total new apartments or beds dedicated. Um, that's in white versus 444 in fiscal year 25. Those are the new either apartments or beds that are coming online through the model that I've done. The line right below this is actually a really interesting one that I want you to focus on a second. This is the existing nonprofit permanently affordable housing rental stock that we have across the state that the state has invested in over 30, 40 years. These are permanently affordable, and they are actually right now a really valuable resource um, for the situation that we're in. Because when we have a turnover, when someone moves out and someone else moves in, 35% of the time, we're bringing someone in from coordinated entry. So as you see, we're almost housing as many people coming out of homelessness with no new capital dollars going in in the existing portfolio as we, as we would be in my projection in this first year. And that's an ongoing benefit that the state has because you've uh, invested in permanently affordable housing. Representative Bilker. Very quickly, is that 420, the 35%, so is the real number a, yes. a larger number? Yeah, so okay. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the assumptions at the, at the end, but roughly 100 homes 
turnover statewide in the portfolio every month. So and that's, about, and that's based on, um, VHV has provided you an Act 81 report. Mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know if both committees have been receiving those. Um, that's based on that last, the last six months of, of, um, of numbers. I see, so it's 1,200 a year and 35% of yeah. that's 420. Okay, got it, yeah. thanks. And, and that would be presuming that we maintain a 35%. I mean, yes. and, uh, so statute would need to be changed in order to put that in. Um, yeah, this is not in statute. This is just, we are, we're mission-based. Well, we're right now, yeah. We're mission -based and, yeah. Um, in fact, I think the number in the last six months has been 38%, it, but it fluctuates per region because it, it's just, it's, um, it's better to take a, a look at over time for this summer. Um, the um, the stress that the I'll, I'll just say this out loud because it's it's challenging for the affordable housing network um, with this uh, the twenty five percent up top of housing that many people coming out of homelessness plus the thirty five percent at turnover. Our um, our organization has invested um, charitable dollars into some resident services so that we can intervene because people really need some added level of support that maybe not, um, you know, clinical or, but, but they just need like um, someone to, um, someone to support them as well as, as we go along. So we've actually invested in, in some of that stuff because we're the, you know, our property managers and our maintenance uh, folks are the ones that are in the buildings, they're seeing what's happening. We can, we can step in and provide a little bit of support to get them to the next place. So that's just, um, uh, so, um, so if you look down at the bottom over over the next several years, we're really generating, um, you know, close to 600 or so in the first couple of years, or I'm sorry, 800 or, or 800 to 900 um, available beds or uh, um, apartments for people coming out of homelessness. Get that? I'm, I'm hoping that if you look at this year, 29, 30, like, um, I think we should be getting to a point where really homelessness is really rare and brief. And when I was with the Human Services Committee last week and I put that picture up of the family, the first one, the first family that moved into Harbor Place, they were there for three weeks. It was just an economic issue. And we were able to solve that issue. So if we can create the housing as we go along, and we can create these opportunities for people. I think we can have a system that is not crisis driven. And that's um, uh, really uh, providing support where, when people need it. Just, you just went offline. Oh, I went offline. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Take your time. Do I have a service? <laughs> So it looks like you, uh, I'm, I'm doing that right now. Kind of interesting that you um, bumped off when you're just getting to the dollar figures. There's those little, little dollar gremlins in your computer. We wanted to end on magical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is actually my favorite slide. <laughs> um, because if you know me, I, I like to um, yeah, great. Um, um, I like to hang hang around the appropriations committee. Um, but, You're represented here today, so it's good. Um, not that I don't like hanging around with you too. <laughs> um, so here is here's how the money flows. And and this is again, as I started at the beginning, I had 18 different kind of sets of criteria. And what I um, uh, focused this modeling on was the capacity of the affordable housing uh, um, development sector to move money through. And so as you see at the top, um, the first chunk of things, uh, items, are um, uh, money that flows through VHCB, and you see 110 is actually level funded across the board, across the 10 years. Um, um, 
And, and then the next one down, and I should have put this in red because it would have tracked back, but is the, those specialized needs beds that nest medical respite. And those, are, um, those numbers are, are there. Um, VHIP is the next line. Um, this, I'm making the assumption, maybe others will have different assumptions that um, there may be a little bit of the low hanging fruit has been picked and it may be harder to move as much money through that program in the future. So I had 10, 10 million in the first couple of years and then it scales back, but it continues to be a resource. Um, support for manufactured home communities because that's really important to make sure people are supported. And then um, this uh, home ownership program so that people have mobility. All right. So that's how, when I do my modeling, this is what it costs, the capital side. Um, services side, because we know we can't do this without services. And that, um, it's contemplated a new uh, resident services fund to support um, uh, folks coming out of homelessness that um, uh, are existing uh, in existing services programs. Um, that starts at 6 million, and then it goes up as we add more units on, as I add more apartments in, and as well as as uh, we, um, as a, a COLA of inflationary number. Um, eviction prevention, I know. I'm sorry, uh, Chris, in, in your <laughs> chart, do you uh, figure that costs, like per square foot costs, remaining the same over the 10 years, or is there an inflation factor built? There's an inflation. I'll, I'll show you the, the assumptions in a second. It's about 5%. <laughs> um, so the, um, the resident services fund comes goes up as we add more homes into the system, but also as um, just inflation costs. I did 3% for these, these bottom numbers. Um, uh, and so there's a eviction prevention. I know you um, are supported that in the Budget Adjustment Act. Um, that's really critical. If we want to create this system, we also don't need, we need to stop having a leaky bucket. This does, I cannot, uh, I thought about it, but I can't really model how many people are falling into homelessness and how, like, what the churn is here. It's really, it's beyond my brain, my brain power. Yeah. Um, I can give it a try if people really, if people want me to, but it, um, it's difficult to do. Um, so as you see, the new, the in the bottom, um, four lines of the bottom section here, these are those new special, um, special initiatives that I talked about in the beginning. And so we have, end up with about, um, between 20 and 40 million, um, uh, 20 going up to 40 million in services over the next 10 years. And then the total package is roughly $200 million per year for 10 years. You have one more page? I have, well, I could show you one more, one more quick page. And this is the one where I, we can't really go down too deep in, but you can look on your own and I'm happy to talk about any of these with people privately or we want to talk about some of them now, but these are those, those 18 assumptions and data points that I put into a lot of formulas and models and so forth that come up with the little earlier sheets. So two things um, that are less questions, uh, less questions should be for the, for the group, but just to be clear, the hundred and ten million dollars, or even one hundred and seventy-seven, that's that's our that would be the state's investment, which represents really just a smaller percentage of actual costs that it would take mm -hmm. to build these units. So while the number at one hundred and ten million dollars, that's the same as saying that that could represent X percent of what the actual costs of this housing is going to be, but this would be the state's investment. In this is the state's investment, and there is leverage with federal tax credits that we get when we invest in rental housing development that bring in um, anywhere between 30 and 65% of the, of the cost of the housing. So there is leverage. Um, and so not all the programs have leverage, and I think um, Gus has talked to you about shelters. It's 100% in with state money because there's no other leverage, no other source. And so um, some, money, some money can leverage others, but not all, not all the time. So can I ask for a clarification of Tom's question? So in other words, this represents for the state share someplace between 40 and 60%. So sort of reversing the, the numbers that you just said. Uh, 40 and 60% of the unit development would be the cost 
is projected here to be state funds? Uh, just for that rental production line. Okay. All right. And there may be some, and the homeownership has some, um, so I can, I can, um, I can get some more clarification in terms of, in terms of which ones have more leverage. Trying to figure, yeah, trying to figure out sort of like if we make this investment, what are we leveraging? Yeah. And again, I think it's different, it's different levels at different projects. I mean, it, yep. so, so getting, you know, if we need a clarification of what a 4% deal is, what a 9% deal versus a 0% deal is. So uh, what I didn't give you is all my other uh, spreadsheets that I have that create these numbers that incorporate those other sources of funds in them. So I didn't, that would have been, if someone wants to really nerd out with me, I'm happy to <laughs> sit down. Those numbers spreadsheet. are baked into this. Uh, excuse excuse into me, we need. Oh, so this is. Uh, Representative Hyman. Uh, Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's a question for you. What is incorporated in eviction prevention? Um, what was the, uh, what programs are in? Um, this is, these are the three programs that, and maybe the chair can um, identify them better, but there's two and a half, I believe, for back rent. The proposal was for two and a half million dollars to reinstate the CRF era back rent program which was estimated to prevent over the course of that grant um, up to 346 evictions. Um, so while Chris can't compute what the churn might be, 346 per evictions prevented or they're prevented. You know, so they're not like, they, they can't be counted as evictions if they're not. Um, a certain amount of money was going to go to have a rental stability program coming out of CVOEO in Burlington, which is, has a statewide um, program. And then a million dollars roughly of that would have been for what we felt was an, an incredibly important full representation pilot program. Um, we found that seven, we took testimony that said 70% of all evictions could be avoided if the tenants had equal representation in the eviction courts. And um, we were going to, the, the first million dollars was going to a pilot program. In two counties that had been used as eviction counts several years ago for a study done by Legal Aid on eviction prevention um, and what it would cost. So that was a total package of roughly $3.9 million. The policy passed in Act 47 last year we proposed the House passed um, that money to be in the BAA, and as of yesterday or so, uh, yeah. it's not. It's it's still in it's still in process. For that, uh, Representative Hyman, and then Representative Elder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just for clarification about the federal monies, mm -hmm. those monies are already baked into these numbers. So the rental number of 47.2 million is the ask from the state because the federal money is already assumed to be in that number. Correct. Um, I'm just looking at, just trying to square some of the numbers. We're talking about 7,500 new uh, units of housing kind of in, in aggregate, but then we get some different, slightly different numbers throughout the presentation. So just looking at some of the FY34 numbers, I'm seeing the 7560. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that makes sense. That's kind of in reference to that. Uh, understanding it takes it a year further, but I'll just stick with FY34. Now, when we look at the next page, and this is to help people who are unhoused, the 6034 is in that same year as the 7560, but the difference is the 7560 is all new. And of this 6,034, we actually have to back out 4,200 to account for the existing portfolio. So when I do that, I've got about 1,800. So we're, we're of the 7,500 new units we're gonna create over 10 years according to this plan, about 1,800 of those will go to people who are unhoused when we're just talking about the new stock. Does that track? Um, yes, with the caveat that three hundred of them are not uh, are not in the seventy five hundred number because they're shelter beds or um, the, the service. Right. Okay. So that number is in there too. So 
that total number would be 300. So you'd really be talking about more like 1,500. Out of the 70, so the 7,500 has um, a lot of other things, a lot of other potential lot of programs in it. Programs in it. But at the end of the day, we're talking about of this 10 year, $2 billion investment, we're talking about 1,500 units at the end of it, approximately, of new housing going to people who were in coordinated entry previously. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I think one of the things, Chris, maybe um, uh, for you to say a little bit about is that, well, one, um, this is a, a model and there's opportunity to, you know, for us here now that we have this model to um, change percentages, for instance, that, that maybe we would want to see. But I, I think um, understanding Representative Elder's um, question also, we'd be looking at the um, at the turnover that's happening in existing housing as well to, to look at how many people who are in a homeless situation um, would be uh, have access to permanent housing. So I think it is important for us to remember that that the, these total numbers make are made up of different types of housing, some permanent, some not permanent. And so we have to kind of like look at each almost like look at each line. Yeah. With an emphasis, again, to remind that the, the reason we're here is to talk about low income housing. So that include any of the more middle income above 80 percent of area median income housing that they proposed and talked about either. This is we're just trying to keep this conversation. You know, we will keep this conversation down. To this focus, because there are other programs out there. Yeah. Low and very low income. Yep. Yeah. So what, I'll, what I'll just say to that and not to disagree with you. Um, um, right now in Burlington at the Elmwood Community Shelter, we have 120 to 130 people on a waiting list for eight by eight foot pods. A half a mile away to the south, there's new apartments that are being generated, built right now, that are going to be going for four to 4,500 for a two bedroom a month. Yeah. And a half mile to the south is a $1.5 million condo being built. So we need, it's the, the system is is busted. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not worried about building for those. No, I'm not either. No, no, that's I'm, what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm not either. I, I'm, I, know, I know you're not. I know it's, it's, it's by example, which I think is just, you know, putting an exclamation point behind what you were saying, so, Stevens. Yeah, thank you. It, it needs an exclamation point cause, yes. because the problem is wide. It, and we're always afraid of losing the conversation on this particular group in the conversation because poverty is hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. Other questions from um, any committee member in the room, any legislator? Yeah. Just to be clear, again, this investment, you've made estimates on service investments. I mean, this housing won't succeed. And this is just kind of the way that I think all these the committees feel. Simply building four walls and a roof isn't enough to help do the long-term correction that we're talking about here. So simply building units, great, fine, it's very expensive, but without the other the other supports, the other vouchers, the other things that will help people stay in those apartments and create a stable tenancy. And this does, this addresses it. You address it with some of the services, but that's just the onus on the housing, especially affordable housing organizations. The limit is you can't do it all. Like we need participation from the DAs, the SSAs, the state, make sure that these other services are there in order to, if we're making this investment, we have to make that other investment. Is, I mean, that's my, I think that's the way that, that personally, we, we've heard the testimony over the course of this session and, and beyond. Uh, okay, uh, Representative Brumstead, uh, Representative Noyes, and then Representative Hunt, not Representative Hunt, okay. So understanding that <clears throat> this is a 10 year plan that you were asked to think about, if we in, is the, is it your sense that if we invest the two hundred million a year for ten years, that at the end of ten years, everything will turn over as we need it and will be sort of 
Wonderful. Self stable. Yeah, it's self -sustaining. Yeah. Sustaining. It's wonderful, like that kind of word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mission accomplished, you mean? Yeah. Um, uh, I I can't I can't say that there's there's a housing needs assessment being done. Um, what I can say is that I I'm impatient. I don't think we need to wait for a housing needs assessment to say that we need to build more housing and need to provide these services. And um, I don't think we're in danger of overbuilding anytime soon. Um, so I, I can't say in ten years or eight years or twelve years that that that's it. Um, at least. <laughs> We're absent that that data. Yeah, I just think it's easier for people to think about an investment like that when they think, if we this is why we need to do this today, and this is what we can look forward to tomorrow. And one, one thing I'll I'll just I'll say, I don't know, stop talking, but um, um, uh, when we get the the housing needs assessment, if there's some kind of thinking that we need to do some more planning at that point. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. I I would um, and being the impatient person I am, I I can imagine people wanting to create a stakeholder group, going out and doing community meetings all over the summer across the state, getting input, coming back with a report next January to say we need to build more housing. <laughs> I'm here right now today saying we need to build more housing. Sorry, sorry. I know I'm just sorry. I'm sorry to laugh about it because it is it's it almost um, sounds ridiculous now, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, Representative Noise. Madam Chair. Um, so this is 200 million a year for, for 10 years. What has been our, have you looked at our past investments in housing? And a portion of that 200 would be federal dollars, correct? Um, the, uh, no, it's, it would not be federal dollars. It's, it's 200 million is all state dollars this year. In the last three years, when we have had some federal dollars and there's been some state surplus, We've invested between 110 and 150 in capital. The new um, services in my model are, is new spending. We have not been spending on We've been spending other programs. And one thing I can't, I just haven't been able to wrap my head around is how all of this would intersect or interact with the current budget construct. That's someone else is going to have to figure out how all those things mesh together. I, 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 yeah, I'm just going with spreadsheet. <laughs> I think that's probably our job to figure out. <laughs> Follow up. Have you looked at any um, of location of where this housing could be built, like a percentage of urban versus rural? No, I think that will come through a housing needs assessment. This is really just a model to say if we can run some, if we can put some money into the system that we have, the existing capacity in the system that we have, add some service capacity, what do we get? That's really the exercise I was asked to do. Um, I'm, I'm just going to check in to see if anybody on housing in general has questions for so just that's for him. Okay. Go ahead, Representative Garifano. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm wondering, there was a report last year, uh, a housing needs assessment for folks with disabilities that uh, reported that 600 uh, supportive housing units were needed mm -hmm. to meet those needs. And I wondered if that was incorporated into your model at all? Not that, not that specific need. And I try to stay up high and, and not get into the too many of the specific types of programs. We're actually one of the grantees, CHT, of this uh, um, planning grant that's happening. So I think there's it's a model that we need to test and, and build out. But I didn't say, again, it's not a housing needs assessment. It's just, uh, just modeling about how we can run the money through the system. But there's nothing preventing that from happening no, no, within no, no, this no. model. No. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I didn't point out senior housing in here or right, right. housing or, you know, so those are all things that need to get done. But Those will be policy decisions. Yeah. 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 Representative Elder. Yes, sure. A um, couple of observations. Uh, one, I hope that you'll give the, this is an excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope in some fashion our colleagues on energy and environment can see it since they do have sole domain over Act 250 in this chamber. Um, it is something that uh, <clears throat> I think limits our work, but it is the, the, the rules we're currently operating under. So I just hope they can see this because it's a, it's a critical part of the housing reform lies in, in neither of our commits. Um, so that's just one observation. The second observation is that <clears throat> I really appreciate the sort of um, conservatism in these numbers, but the numbers are so high, 
for an apartment, you know, 475, five, 500 for a unit, the same as a standalone house. So not trying to dig into that, just trying to say, I'm going to liken this to our school construction conversation where we say, well, we're going to spend 6 billion over 10 years and instead of 2 billion. And our average cost per construction might be 600 to a thousand dollars per square foot. The state of Vermont needs to leverage uh, this kind of buying power in the marketplace and demand better pricing. You know, I, that, that's that's what I think. And um, I just I'm so appreciative of this work, but I hope that we can continue to um, make sure that when we put this kind of money on the table, which I do think is a critical investment, that we set expectations for the market in terms of value for money, because I I'm having seen the firehouse apartments go up in my community, which we're so happy to have. Uh, I'm astonished at the cost involved. Uh, Rep. Sam Bloomley. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and thanks for, for all this work, Chris. Um, I, have, I, I have a question. <clears throat> I asked this question in um, our committee yesterday when the Agency of Commerce presented its budget. And, you know, the FY25 budget right now contains very little investment in housing. Um, that's that's that targets <clears throat> new housing development and 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 I I gather from the administration that really they are counting on zoning reforms to pave the way for new construction and that that will contribute significantly to meeting the deficit that we have and my question is whether you believe that you know how, how much impact would that have? Um, you could say, and um, <clears throat> well, I just I'll leave it at that. I I do not know what the um, uh, reforms to Act Two Hundred and Fifty or others will save us. But just to throw a number out, say it's five percent or ten percent, and the housing still costs five hundred thousand dollars. Have a four hundred seventy-five thousand or four hundred fifty thousand dollar house, and who is that affordable to? Um, or apartment? That's it's. We still need to figure out a way to subsidize um, these the, the rents down to a place where people can afford it. It's it's. Act two fifty is going to do something, and I'm I'm supportive of it of, of performing it, but it's not going to solve the problem. So I want to make sure that I understood what you said, um, Chris, in that. Uh, Act 250 reforms alone will not solve our homelessness problem without further investment. Not even close. Thank you. Just, just wanted to be absolutely clear about that. Representative Gregoire. Well, I just wanted to follow up on what Representative Elder was saying is that, um, you know, we, we have to have some regulatory um, reform, but also, um, as I said the other day in a, in a hearing, that, um, you know, Subsidized housing is a part, a, a temporary solution, but it's not the solution. We need to have affordable housing. And so to leverage whatever we can in order to drive costs down that have skyrocketed is, is going to be the essential component because if 475 or 500,000 for an apartment or, I mean, in some of these houses that are dilapidated in sector for 300,000 um, isn't sustainable and it's not going to help us get out of a crisis or any other problem, um, but we need to get those costs down to have low, uh, you know, affordable housing, not not subsidized housing, long term. Just to that, I I, I want to emphasize too that there's many levers of cost that are out of our control. Mm -hmm. um, we had a presentation from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency that showed us a bar chart that drywall is now. X percentage higher in cost plywood um, mm -hmm. uh, labor costs always support having people getting paid better for the work that they're doing for difficult jobs. That's reflected at the price of housing. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be clear that our work is simply trying to get a handle on what the, the problem is, how we get there and what we, you know, interest rates doubling or doubling the cost of money. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just all part of, uh, that's all part of this equation as well, or it's, it's all part of the discussion, not this particular equation. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you coming in, Chris, and, and actually spending all this time 
on this on this um, presentation. It's really quite helpful. Very helpful. Yes. Um, thank you. We're going to wrap up questions on this section now. And uh, Chris, I, I really honestly, um, you know, you took up the challenge when we met this fall and uh, you ran with it. And um, it's honestly the first time in my nine years here that I've seen um, actually something that was comprehensible, clear, um, well thought out. It's not to say that we don't have, you know, tweaks that we would like to make here and there or um, that there'll be additional thinking. As you said, it's a it's an evolving process, but it is um, it's more of a roadmap. And, and I use that word on purpose um, than uh, than I've seen um, you know, in quite some time. So I appreciate the leadership that you've taken on this and um, appreciate our, our continuing to work with you. I, I had a lot of advice with this. So it's, it's, a, um, it's an iterative process. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have a little adjustment in the um, agenda. We're going to invite Commissioner Winters up next. If anybody who is going to join him. You might need to bring a chair with you. <laughs> this is the low. This is the low cost version of a state house hearing. <laughs> bring your own chair. Meanwhile, Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for uh, thank you all for being here. And um, as you heard from our previous witness, we have a big challenge in front of us, and we're interested to hear from the Department for Children and Families. Um, and we'll be followed up by ACCD. Um, but uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, good morning, everyone. And Chair Wood. And Chair Stevens, thank you for, for having us here today. I thought that we could start with um, kind of laying uh, out the landscape of the general assistance housing program and the, the status of our shelter system across the state to kind of give a picture of what we do have for beds right now in this space. Some of the information that we know about the populations we are temporarily housing um, and how we start to match that up with the, the unit generation conversation, the unit needs across the state, kind of paint the big picture. A lot of this is gonna be very familiar to the uh, Human Services Committee um, and the Housing and General Committee, maybe not quite so much, uh, but we have a, a, a slide deck. There's quite a bit of information in it. I can jump through some of these slides fairly quickly. Um, and of course, up to you whether you, you wanna ask questions as we go or take them at the end, but I do hope that we get to the in this conversation. And, and why don't we uh, wait on questions until the end or until there's a space where you think it's good to pause? And um, can you just clarify for us, Commissioner Winters, um, is this representing what the current policy is versus what the state's um, proposed policy is for FY25? So what you'll see in this slide deck is current policy um, and current uh, work that we have done and there is also some information about in there about work that we could do if there were more units available. And I, I'm sorry, I did not say for the record, my name is Chris Winters, the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. And joining me today is the Deputy Commissioner Miranda Gray for Economic Services Division and Interim Director of the Office of Economic Opportunity, Lily Sojourner. So it would be helpful as you go through the things and you're pointing out current services, if you could highlight the things that um, are changing or have been, excuse me, have been proposed to change in the governor's budget. Because um, I, I think it's important for people to understand what the administration is proposing as well as what it is that is currently being provided. Absolutely. Madam Thank Chair. you. All right, and Lily is running the slideshow. Thank you, Lily. And we have it up, so we're good to go. Thank you. Um, so the very first slide is just to give you a, a demographic of the current households that are in our shelter system, that are in our GA program. Uh, which is, you know, approximately 500 shelter beds and approximately 1,600 uh, hotel rooms across the state. 
And you can see there are categories uh, of eligibility, catastrophic, that's fire, flood, death of a spouse or minor child, domestic violence and sexual violence, constructive eviction uh, for no cause, court-ordered eviction. And, uh, and that currently is a, an 84-day 84 uh, 84 stay in a shelter or a hotel. Uh, under the proposal for FY25, that would be reduced to 28 days, same as the next category, which is currently 28 days, would stay at 28 days. For uh, the vulnerable population, those are folks who are an SSI, SSDI recipient, age 65 plus, pregnant in third trimester, children under 18 or 19 if attending school, um, or just say children in general and children up, up to age 19 if still attending school. Uh, and then there's also a point system for different categories and accumulation of points uh, qualifies you as well. Things such as disabled vet, open family services case, SSI, SSDI applicant, discharged from a hospital recently, or discharged from DCF custody within the last three years, reach up recipient or probation or parole. So it's accumulation of, of some of those things uh, makes you eligible. And then there's adverse weather conditions. And that is um, dependent, it's a, what we call a hybrid model for adverse weather, dependent upon weather from November 15th to December 15th, and then also dependent on weather from March 15th to April 15th. And then it's non-weather dependent from December 15 to March 15 for homeless households uh, and also uh, ineligible for the GA program if you refuse the shelter bed or other alternative housing. Uh, so it's kind of the demographic of the 1,600 plus households we currently have in GA housing and hotels and motels across the state, and another 530, I want to say, shelter beds that we that we currently have, uh, what we call the traditional shelter bed system. Uh, so those are connected with services, of course, and the GA housing and hotels really are not connected with services. Um, the next slide is just a, a quick, you know, visual of the timeline of of, uh, of the GA housing program. Um, in FY from 22 to, to present, uh, we have our traditional emergency housing program that was in place uh, that had been uh, kind of opened up post uh, COVID to um, allow us to have non congregate settings for uh, especially our most vulnerable Vermonters. And Vermont has done a really good job of housing the unsheltered uh, in, during that time. Uh, we had our tra transitional housing program start in July 2022 when some of the federal funding was changing. Uh, in November of 22, we went to adverse weather conditions with relaxed rules. And just kind of a reminder here that it used to be that night to night weather dependent adverse weather was what we had pre COVID. Um, and we had you know lower numbers of homelessness, but it just, just to kind of point out historically, that we have always had to make difficult decisions, you know, both budgetary policy and, and looking at the humans involved as to who gets shelter. And we've never said we're going to shelter every single Vermonter. Um, so there are always diff difficult, difficult choices to make. And that's what we were living with in, in the past uh, prior to my time here as DCF commissioner was that night to night uh, through the winter. Um, adverse weather conditions were extended until June 1st of 2023 and in March last last year. Um, and then uh, as of June 1st, we had uh, those adverse weather conditions, folks were no longer eligible. That was 800 households. You all I'm sure remember very well, uh, June of, of last year when those folks were exited from the program. And then in June of 2023, Act 81 passed that, that kept us what we refer to as the cohort um, in until uh, that law has them in until April 1st of this year. And that was about um, 1,300 households. It's now down to around 600. And we have more specifics on that. I'll show you in just a minute. Here's some of the information that we have to kind of understand who it is that needs uh, housing and is being temporarily housed, are being temporarily housed. We have households by district. We can show you by our district offices, our 12 district offices, the total eligible households. Uh, currently, and that those households are 1,628 uh, as of the 5th. And you can see the distinction here between uh, cohort households, that 600 plus that I was talking about that used to be around 1,300, and the non-cohort households, 
folks who have um, general eligibility through those uh, two categories of catastrophic and vulnerable that were on the first slide. And then the adverse weather conditions, uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness, uh, who came in from the cold uh, over the last couple of months. And the, those that adverse weather conditions eligibility is set to run out on March 15th, where it will go night to night, depending on the weather when the weather reaches a, a certain temperature uh, with a combination of precipitation, we open adverse weather again. So people may be coming in and out of uh, adverse weather eligibility starting March 15th. Um, and then it all ends on, uh, on April 15th. The next slide is, is the June cohort. This is what we, you know, we do track this. We do report on this every single month. So we know more about the, the June cohort portion of folks in the GA housing program um, because uh, they're re required to engage with us. We do case management. Um, we do complex care for those folks, and we've been working with them uh, as hard as we can to get those those folks into housing. You know, the intent, I think, when Act 81 was passed, that we get those folks housed by April 1st. You can see that's not going to happen. Uh, there were 1,289 households when we started. We're down to 616. Uh, that's 674 households that have transitioned out. And you see the average nightly rate, which we track, is, uh, is currently at $131 a night per hotel room. The next is uh, households by cohort size. So this can inform the kind of units that we need uh, looking at it, uh, the unit needs in each district. So again, here's the district with the number of households, uh, I'm sorry, number of people in each of the households. You see it's a large number of one person households, uh, but there are still significant numbers of two person and three person households and the number of children in the cohort. We do also have information uh, about size of household and number of children in the general population as well. So beyond just the 600 households in the cohort, uh, you know, the, the additional households in the other programs, we have the same demographic information that can help inform what the housing unit needs are in each region. We have it by county um, and we have it by size. The, the next page shows you the eligibility categories of each of the households. So this can further inform what kind of housing that we need. Uh, we have the categories of age 60 plus, uh, disabled by the definition of, of qualifying for SSI and SSDI, domestic violence, families with children, health code violations and evictions, natural disaster, uh, pregnant. Uh, and this is again, the cohort, but we can get this for the larger population. Commissioner Winters. Yes. Um, I just, uh, commissioner, uh, commissioner uh, Chair Stevens is like, he's, there's a lot of slides in this slide deck. And I'm thinking like, I'm just wanting to make sure that there's ample time for questions and for other witnesses. So I'm, I'm thinking that if we can focus in on things that are um, uh, for the future, you know, things that we're looking at in terms of expanding shelter capacity, what the plans are for the GA emergency housing for the future, what, um, what your plans are for temporary shelters versus permanent shelters, um, that that type of thing. And you know, feel free to go quickly through your slides, but I'm just thinking when we get to, um, I know there's gonna be questions, let's just put it that way, so. <laughs> I'm very surprised there might be questions. Now, uh, <laughs> I, will, I will try to move quickly through some of the background, but I think this kind of paints, I'm trying to at least paint the picture of what the population is and what the unit needs are. Uh, appreciate that very much to inform yeah. you know some of the unit uh, work that we are doing so these you know these categories these demographics help us match up what we know about the needs the family size the location and try to understand the unit needs in each district and you know we have that case management with a, a portion of the population in ga so we know uh, what apartments are needed by bedroom size who need who might need an accessible unit who might need a nursing home bed um, be open to uh, or want a trailer rental who would um, be appropriate for a shared living arrangement. Uh, so all this data that we have does inform uh, some of our housing work. 
And then just looking at the total individuals, because we, we talk about households a lot and, and it doesn't always reflect the total number of individuals that we are talking about here. So housing by program category, we have in number of individuals is 2,605 individuals when the number of households is a little over 1,600. And that's 1,970 adults and 635 children. Very quickly, a couple of background slides on the number of households we're serving annually. You can see from FY17 up through FY23, uh, the number of households we've served really spiked in, in 21. It's, you know, so we have 1,600 households in GA housing right now, but there's a lot of churn of people coming in and out. Uh, so 3,600 in, in FY20, almost 5,000 in FY21. That's come down a little bit in FY22 and FY23, but you should understand that we are turning away households every night because of a full hotel system. Very important, I think, here to understand the average cost per night for hotels and motels, so what we're spending now versus what we could be spending um, in another way. Uh, so it started out as uh, $74 uh, per night in FY17, an average of about 75 just before the pandemic hit. And then you kind of see the, the spike to a doubling of the average hotel rate um, in the last six years. And I appreciate this committee's work on, on a price cap and trying to put pressure on the hotels to lower those rates. We are, we are the negotiations are ongoing. We have some hotels that have stepped forward and said, yes, we'll accept a, a reasonable rate of $75. Others who wanna talk about perhaps another path. Um, so those negotiations are, are ongoing um, and we have more hotels at the table willing to talk to us than we ever have had before. And we appreciate the committee's assistance on that. And this is the total cost of the general assistance program over the years uh, from FY18 to FY23. You'll see the you know, big jump during COVID. We had an influx of federal money that really, um, encouraged and allowed us to, to do these things. But you look at you know, a $14, 000, $14 million program uh, just prior to, to COVID, and then a you know, 52 million in FY21, 54 million in FY22. FY23 shows um, 34 million, but that's um, not really reflective of the uh, actual because the, we had a different program start at that time. So the overall actual for FY23 was actually 95 million, uh, but that was inflated because it included security deposits. You know, the federal program ended and we started a Vermont program, it included security deposits. Uh, rates jumped at that time from 119 a month to 143. And we paid for entire months at a time because it was treated as a rental. Um, so that's a little bit deceptive in 23. And as you know, for FY24, we're looking at about $60 million uh, spent on the hotel motel program. Very quickly, key concerns with the motel system. I think you all know this. It's, it's inconsistent access to services. Uh, providers have safety concerns providing services on site at some locations. Health and safety in general, the conditions of hotels. We've had a number of battles there and, and, and brought enforcement actions with the Department of Health, uh, concerns over exploitation and abuse of, a get, of guests, um, movement across districts destabilizes health and social services and inconsistent amenities uh, from hotel to hotel. So high cost for low return, 132 average nightly rate recently. It's about $4,000 a month without providing any services. And as you all know, we would prefer to, to house people in our traditional shelters that include case management, housing navigation, warm meals, laundry, and, and many other things. And I'd, I'd love to just give a quick um, overview and, and maybe have Lily Sojourner chime, chime in a little bit here about our housing opportunity grant program. We've made investments there. There's additional investments uh, this year, uh, $27 million of state and federal funding with OEO partnering with over 40 programs across the state uh, to provide housing. And fiscal year 24 includes 7.8 million in one-time funds that predominantly funded emergency shelters and financial assistance. Moving very quickly to some of the things that, that uh, the HOP program um, 
funds and the award summary. That's things like emergency shelter, operations and essential services, transitional housing, homelessness prevention services, rapid rehousing services, coordinated entry, innovation, homeless management information system, and flexible client-based financial assistance. See for yourself the pie chart and some of the awards. Move right along to the hop um, client-based financial assistance. If you have in, um, any questions or follow-ups on that, uh, Lily can answer those, but you can just see the kind of the, the network of local providers that provide all of these uh, homelessness services, uh, whether it's Brock in, in, in Bennington, Capstone in Barry and Morrisville, CBOEL in Burlington and St. Albans, you can see the list there uh, of the, all of the people who participate in uh, preventing and addressing unsheltered homelessness in Vermont. And a lot of that happens through the HOP grant funding uh, that this body approves and is administered through our Office of Economic Opportunity. So looking at what it costs for uh, sh a shelter um, per household, per night, it can, it can vary from 90 to $150 a night. So that's you know somewhat in line with what we're paying for hotels and motels, but you get so much more with a shelter uh, than you do with a hotel room. It's least, it's least expensive uh, as an emergency. The, the least expensive of these is the emergency apartment model for families. And that's part of our um, temporary solutions in the, in the BAA is to expand some of those uh, working with Capstone. Capstone. Um, and in a facility-based project, we have learned that the most cost-effective models seem to be between 20 and 30 households. Uh, recommended that we don't go higher than 40 households is generally our approach. And in older projects, uh, OEO tends to fund a lower share of the project. Um, and for more recent projects, OEO is finding funding 95 to 100% of the cost. And when we talk about our shelter system, we have you know, constant challenges of locations, of community support, and it's particularly of the workforce to um, run the shelters and provide the services. So we have been uh, beating the bushes for the last couple of years, trying to expand our traditional shelter system, but there are those challenges that we face every time. They're often expensive, take a long time to set up, uh, take a lot of community in interaction, and we don't always have the workforce to run. <clears throat> So a little bit more on the HOP shelter data um, in S and in uh, fiscal year 23, 3,180 people were sheltered. So again, people coming in and people going out of the, the shelter system, 2,547 adults, 633 children, and the average length of stay was 64 nights. Uh, so you see the length of stay in our shelter system is um, uh, much uh, smaller than, than what we see in the GA housing program. Here's the average length of stays in a graph. You can see that it has gone up. And uh, I think that's very much a reflection of the lack of units and lack of places for people to move on to. Even though they're wrapped in, in supports and services and housing navigation um, and subsidies, uh, it's very difficult to have those programs be effective if we don't have the units. And this is the overall emergency shelter capacity. I think just a, a, maybe a, a few months ago, that capacity was much lower at, at about 460. We've increased it by 80 beds recently through HOP funding. Um, and we also are increasing it by another 100 beds over the next year. Uh, that's base funding that is in the budget. It's uh, $7.2 million, I believe, for the ongoing operation uh, additional shelter capacity. So going from somewhere around 180 beds to uh, perhaps 660 in the coming year. And so that's a, a significant increase of our emergency shelter uh, capacity separate from what we have in the hotels and motels. And I think as, as most people here know, we are a shelter first state. So you're offered a shelter bed if that's available before you're eligible for uh, the GA housing and a, a hotel program. The next slide is about that shelter expansion, and I'm trying to move through these just as quickly as I can. The budget does include $7.1 million in additional base funding for that shelter capacity. There are eight projects and approximately 180 households uh, to be supported through that expansion. Uh, and that's ongoing base funding. 
Uh, these projects are supporting community providers with track records for offering emergency shelter. So we're working with, uh, with what we know works, with providers that we know are effective uh, to help expand and develop new shelter projects. Five emergency shelter projects are supported in FY24 with one-time funding. And so just so you get a sense for what those are, the seasonal shelter in Montpelier, the Elks Club, uh, the year-round shelter in St. Johnsbury, and you can see the number of beds there. Young Adult Emergency Apartments in Brattleboro, Preservation of a Shelter Project in Burlington, and Conversation of a Youth Shelter in Burlington, uh, Conversion of a Youth Shelter in Burlington from seasonal to year-round. Those are the FY24 expansions, and the expansions for FY25 are targeted for um, certain communities. These are, are conversations that are a ways down the road, um, and hopefully will come to fruition in FY25, one in Rutland, one in Brattleboro, and one in Hartford. The, so, you know, I know there will be a lot of questions about this. This is the temporary shelters to support um, GA transition. Uh, we are proposing in the BAA $4 million with another $2.3 million in one-time funding that was from Act 81 to set up as many temporary shelters as we can by April 1st uh, to ease the transition from GA and provide some extra time for those who need it. We have um, the Winston Prouty Center in uh, Brattleboro. It's 20 rooms for families with children, about 40 to 48 individuals, services already on site. Uh, that um, makes sense for us to do for approximately 17 months. That's what the provider is able to do. Uh, so we get a pretty good return on investment there. It's uh, for under a million dollars. Capstone Community Action, we have expanded to three emergency shelter apartments. That's seven bedrooms. That can go for 15 months, and they are one-time leases. Um, the Waterbury Armory, uh, which we are, are diligently working on, that's congregate shelter, which we know um, is not ideal, uh, but we're putting all options on the table. Uh, that's 40 individuals um, and is slated for uh, three months at this point, but I think we, we may reassess at some point and see what's working. And mobile units, we have um, potential to set up uh, three mobile sites at 46 beds per site. Uh, those are trailer style units uh, that come with a common space and uh, portable showers and bathrooms. And we can set up up to three uh, up to three sites is what we're looking at for those and 138 individuals. Um, all of these intended to, to provide some options, some to try some new things to relieve some of the pressure in the hotel motel system and send a message that we are not uh, not um, stuck with uh, uh, exclusively using hotels to re relying on hotels to do our GA housing system. Just a couple more slides here, pointing out the permanent supportive housing benefit, which is something that we're working on that is in funded in the budget. Um, it can um, provide direct services to participants uh, starting in January 2025 to have up to 100, uh, 100 participants that we can support with pre-tenancy supports, uh, tenancy sustaining services, and community transition. Uh, direct, uh, Interim Director Sojourner can talk to this uh, a little bit more, but we're pretty excited about this program that can help up to 100 uh, participants. Uh, a couple more slides, one more slide on family supportive housing to give you a little more information about what that program looks like. A few other things that we uh, have been using and are, are very proud of and I think are effective are the home family housing voucher, uh, which launched in January 2023 to help families with children exit homelessness, the landlord, landlord relief program. Uh, which was launched in February 2023 in the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program expansion for reach up families. So a lot of assistance to uh, families in need uh, and uh, renters through these programs to help uh, do some of the prevention, prevention work around homelessness. And just a couple of quick slides to mention that, you know, there are ongoing housing work and options across the Agency of Human Services uh, that include all of the different departments within AHS, 154 residential mental health treatment beds, 63 intensive residential treatment beds, 96 recovering recovery housing beds, 245 Department of Corrections transitional housing beds, and 873 skilled nursing facility beds. 
And just a note there that the Department Disabilities, um, Aging and Independent Living is working with DCF and OEO to hold a webinar to provide more information to get community partners uh, more aware of the eligibility criteria for choices for care and to try to move as many folks who are eligible uh, from the hotels into um, a more appropriate setting for them. And also to note the um, project with BDH, the Homeless Healthcare Capacity Building Projects. Director Sojourner can, can speak to that. And the last two slides really, uh, it's the cost of other programs. And these are some other things that we think could be, we know could be very effective, but are not as effective if we don't have a unit to move people into. Uh, we have the rental assistance programs, home vouchers and rental subsidies. That's you know approximately $24,000 per year per household is what it costs. Uh, and you can compare that to what it costs to house someone in a hotel or motel. Shallow subsidies, um, of approximately $7,000 a year per household, we think could, could help a lot of people out of the hotels and out of, out of homelessness. Permanent supportive housing uh, to enroll uh, additional funds there, could enroll additional households. HOP client-based financial assistance, so we could add to HOP funding uh, if, if that was something the committee wanted to consider, and HOP services. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll just say that when we talk about solutions to Homelessness, we often talk about a three-legged stool of a unit, a subsidy, and services. And while we do have some of the funding and the programs for subsidies and services, we just don't have the units. So we're really sitting on a two-legged stool at the moment. Um, and so Commissioner Farrell, and you know, the last side, just to say that DCF doesn't build housing units, as you all know. Um, we are the option of last resort, and we're supposed to be the, the safety net. That safety net has gotten larger and larger. It's been very easy, I think, for people to say, stick people into hotels and uh, a lot of our other partners kind of stepping back and saying it's been solved. And as you know, that's not the case and we need to do things differently. We do partner with other agencies, uh, housers, community partners, um, and others to inform their work with the data that we have about folks who are experiencing homelessness. And uh, we know that uh, unsheltered homelessness is complex with, with so many root causes. It's going to take a huge effort to address it. Uh, I really appreciated uh, Chris's presentation before me, kind of a, a framework of the size and scope uh, and cost of this. And um, we are uh, very much in favor of a lot of the things that he's proposing. We've identified this, the same needs that he's talking about there in terms of shelter, in terms of specialized kinds of shelters. Um, but it's a matter of, uh, I think, do we have the budget? Do we have the resources? Do we have the workforce uh, to accomplish what, he, what he's talking about there? And I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thank you for indulging me in running through that many slides that quickly. I take breath and <laughs> that you will have uh, a lot of- I wish I had a glass of water for you. <laughs> Feeling like, uh, you know, um, so as, as Chair Stevens predicted, we have a number of on the House General and Housing side of things, and it's uh, Representative Elder, James, and then Krasnow, and, and then uh, Howard. Howard. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you. Representative Mary. <laughs> um, I'm going back to page five, I'm just talking about the June cohort. Um, I just want to clarify, 674 households using the verb transitioned out here, but my understanding is that's just, they left one way or another, right? So that would include people who are kicked out for a cause we wouldn't know by the hotels. And I know you had an, another slide that mentioned exploitation by hotels. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm just trying to say, is there a subset of that 674 you can point to that have actually, what I would consider were transitioned is that they were moved into other housing that we know about? as opposed to just left. Is that a subset that you all can identify? Yes, and uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Gray might have this at her fingertips or not, but we do know to the extent that they let us know when they leave. Sure. Um, I think it's 270 or so that we have confirmed have found other housing. Um, don't quote me on that number, but um, have confirmed to have found other housing. And then there are a lot of other reasons why, why people left. Sometimes it is before a, a violation of the rules of the program or the hotel, that's a smaller subset. Right. Um, people die in these hotels. So, you know, we have older older folks or people who are infirm 
uh, for a variety of reasons. So we have a handful of, of clients who have died while living in, in the hotels. Um, Miranda, you want yeah. some of the other reasons for, for people exiting? Yeah, sure, happy to. For the record, Miranda Gray, Deputy Commissioner for the Economic Services Division. <clears throat> and I do have that number and I'm trying to get it at my fingertips. So hopefully I'll be able to share that with you. But we do have a certain amount of the population that has transitioned into apartments or other housing. Some people have to in with other households. Um, but then um, to go back to your point, if some people maybe have been moved out by mental health, economic services does deal with someone who has been asked to leave a motel. Mm -hmm. And depending on that reason, they might not have been eligible to be in cohort anymore, but they would be eligible for our regular general assistance, emergency assistance housing program. So that also started July 1, we went back to pre-pandemic. And so people were then eligible for either 20 or 84 days. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. And I don't need to speak. I just wanted to, to flag this. I don't think we should use the word transition for people who died or people who um, left for reasons we don't know. I, I it's just a note, I, I would break that into two categories. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks. I do have the exit reasons in front of me and, and it was 222 households as of early January that we confirmed found housing. And we know that by you know whether they went to a hospital or treatment facility, an apartment, housing other than an apartment or housed by another agency. One of the larger categories is no renewal. So they just don't uh, renew their voucher with us and don't tell us why. May have joined another household. Uh, client died. That was that number is 13. Exited for misconduct. That number is 47. Uh, and, and then a few others. I was just going to say, um, and members, you can find that uh, actually fairly easily on the department's website. If you go to DCF and then uh, you look under quick links, it's the first item under quick links and you go through that. And there is uh, on a monthly basis, we required per Act 81, a monthly report from DCF. And um, that's actually that they have uh, updated their exit reasons to be more specific. And um, there's a, a whole drop down there that you can find. Um, and it's at actually 239 now have found housing households. Um, and uh, so thank you, actually. That's a, I hadn't seen this yet. So that's a, a nice breakdown. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, now we have Representative James, then Krasnow, and then Howard. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. I, I'm on page 27, um, the temporary shelters. And I have three, I think, related questions about this slide. Um, if you could remind me, please, um, how many Vermonters should be, um, how many Vermonters we're talking about? So how many beds or spaces or folks do we need to shelter? What deadline it is that the administration is proposing again for this? And then project by project, where you guys are with that? Like contract locked and loaded, the beds are ready, or we're still working on this, hasn't come together yet. I'm, Really sure. trying to get a handle on page 27. How many people do we need to shelter? Mm -hmm. What date are you proposing? And how far along are we with every single one of these projects in the world? And, and I have to tell you, I did not pay Representative James to ask that. <laughs> I did. That is well, the question I ask every time we see DCF, and we'll see we'll see what they answer today. So we'll I'll do my best, uh, and hopefully it's consistent with other things that I've said. Um, it's all very fast moving, and and the goal has been to be ready for April first because the law says that the cohort has until April first. We also know that the adverse weather conditions, um, March fifteenth is the date. So if it's uh, warm enough outside, uh, folks will exit ad adverse weather. And so you can see from kind of earlier in the presentation, trying to lay out the, uh, the numbers there, we have um, those in the cohort 616, let me get to individuals, not households, 616 households, non-cohort households, uh, that's general eligibility for 28 or 84 days. So those folks are always coming in and out. That's 137 households. And then the adverse weather group is 875 households. And if you look at um, individuals, the cohort, and I know we're not supposed to use that word anymore, but um, the April cohort individuals, it's 1,055 individuals, 774 adults. 281 children. That's the group that we've been trying to target with this temporary shelters, understanding 
that there are also uh, as many people coming out of the adverse weather program, Sim similar numbers to who are in the cohort. And historically, um, pre-pandemic, <laughs> would have adverse weather conditions, the adverse weather conditions would end, and those folks would not be housed any longer. Uh, these are larger numbers, much larger numbers than we saw during uh, previous to the pandemic. So we know it's a different equation, uh, but we are expecting that we are trying to plan for April 1st cohort ending uh, and March 15th adverse weather ending by setting up as many temporary shelters as possible with 6.2, 6.3 million dollars in BAA uh, for this fiscal year. Um, and so we have the five uh, areas of the state that we're focusing on where we see the most need. Those areas of the state are Bennington, Brattleboro, Rutland, Central Vermont, uh, and Chittenden County. And so the thoughts, I'll speak now to the some of the, the things that we have in the works, some of the things that are more certain, uh, some of the things that are still not certain. Um, the one that is the most certain, and we're you know, really happy to be able to say this is the Winston Prouty Center in Brattleboro, uh, the former Austin School for the uh, Deaf. And they had some unused dorms and they have the services on site, the Winston Prouty um, Center for Child and Family Development. It's an ideal match for rooms and families. So they had uh, 20 rooms that they could put together a lot of the, the like dorm furniture, like beds and things like that, common living space. They were willing to put that together when we kind of reached out and, and we're looking for temporary options. It's only available for a certain amount of time, but that that's available for 17 months, which is great. We'll take the extra months for the amount invested. Um, Lily can confirm this, but I think it's somewhere around $900,000 to fund this for, um, for the next 17 months. So that one is, Signed, sealed, delivered? We are finalizing the grant agreement. We have an award notice and we're just... I'm just going to ask, why would that not be a permit? I mean, that seems like an opportunity for a permanent shelter at they have, low... Oh, sorry low, to interrupt. <laughs> no, that's okay. At, at, at low um, initial capital investment. Yeah. Sorry. And I don't want to get <clears throat> ahead of um, Winston Prouty and their team but they have um, great plans for their campus and are looking at permanent housing on their campus for these buildings. So I think they're still early in that process. I think if for some reason those plans change, I think that they would definitely partner with us. So um, the long-term plan for the space is in the same spirit, you know, of housing. So thank you. And in all of these conversations, we, we do have to be careful about getting in front of um, the partners or the communities involved. It's really kind of a delicate dance that we're trying to do. We did have one, you know, really great project in Montpelier that I've spoken about a couple of times publicly, but I don't, you know, want to denigrate the, the provider uh, who does wonderful work, um, but their board voted against it because it would stretch them too thin. So we had something that, you know, we thought was fairly certain, started talking about it publicly, um, and then it fell through. So it's, I mean, it's just want to be careful about, you know, saying that anything is even Winston Prouty, which I thought was fairly certain that you still don't have a signed contract. Um, another piece that we're looking at for Central Vermont is Capstone, uh, working with Capstone, three emergency shelter apartments, seven bedrooms, 15 months. Um, the, the price for the, on that one? Um, I want to say it's a little less than $90,000, $87,000. For, for the three. For the three. And that is also, we have an award notice to them and we're, we've sent them a draft grant agreement to confirm. And so that's, you know, small, small, uh, small addition, but an important addition mm -hmm. to have seven extra bedrooms available in, in central Vermont. The Waterbury Armory, um, after, you know, one of our other projects in central Vermont kind of uh, didn't happen, as I was describing. Uh, we really pivoted quickly to the armory as a property that would be available to us and could provide shelter. Um, you've all probably seen that uh, in the news recently. I had a spirited conversation with the community a few weeks ago and, and plan on having more. The um, That shelter is still, that those, those, 
Okay. You'll be on Zoom. <laughs> Join in. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so it's moving, you know, that's moving fast. We have a lot of resources dedicated to it right now. It's, it's the buildings and general services. It's the National Guard. Um, you know, it's, it's our teams um, kind of taking away from, from other work, to, trying to make this happen by April 1st. Uh, we have RFPs to review, um, service providers that we have to bring in because we don't have a local service provider to provide the, the staffing there. A lot of logistics, as you might imagine, around transportation or law enforcement or emergency services or food, um, laundry. Um, so that's coming together very quickly. And as soon as we have more details to share, we can. I don't know if, um, Miranda, if there's anything else you want to share about the, uh, the Waterbury Armory project. No, okay. <laughs> I mean, so sorry, we're sitting right here. I know. Um, so follow up. Yeah, I, I do. Um, Commissioner Winters, I think what we're really trying to get at um, is we have X number of beds. I think you said by the end of FY twenty five, there'd be approximately six hundred and eighty shelter beds. Is that right? Did I write that down? Correctly? I think that's. Right, 680, does that sound right to you, Lily? By the end of FY25, by the end of... Adding an... Uh, 60, by the end of 625? 640, I think, might have been the number. Was it 640? Okay. Um, well, so, Lily, I think we're, yeah, I think it's year. around... We hope to get the full 80 on this year, so it's roughly 100 that we would be adding in state fiscal year. So, mid 600s. Mid 600s. So, so, I'm sorry, what, what's the number? 600. 600 now? Mid 600. Mid 600. 640, 650, and it's going to yeah. depend on the size of the what the provider can do. Okay. Yeah. So just trying to get at what is it that we need as a state? So, Are you saying 640 is it? So there will be 640 ish uh, shelter beds as of the end of FY25. We obviously need many more shelter beds than that. Um, the current funding, the current capacity that we know of with the providers we're working with is to increase by another 100 this year. Uh, we would need to increase by more after that. But at the, in, in July, what will, the t what will the shelter bed capacity, uh, what will the need be? It, it's significant. We don't know exactly how many people have other situations to, to go to uh, if they exit the hotels and motels, but we do know that we have that, uh, that very large number of you know, 2,600 or so individuals, um, depending on what the legislature does, exiting from March through July. Uh, Representative James, you have a follow up and then we'll move on to Representative Kras now. Did, yep. And so I'm just looking again at this page to, to bottom line it for myself. I want to make sure I'm understanding. We've got uh, April 1, 1,000 people more than, not including adverse weather. So April 1, 1,000 people. And on this slide so far, I'm seeing ready to go contract signed room for maybe 100 people. And everything else, is, everything else is in the works or underway or not Correct. Confirmed. Correct. Okay. Representative Krasnow. Yeah. Uh, Representative James took some of my questioning, but um, I guess my first question is, does this money in the VA, does it factor in um, additional costs such as transportation, um, kids moving around to schools, uh, even furniture, upstart costs, things like that, you know, my concern, this should not, if, if kids should not, I believe, legally move to different schools and, and other things like that, is that included in these in this money? I, I think that's separate. I might defer to some of the... Well, I was, oh. yeah, because I have been... So that's more. I'm not sure how that's that's budgeted for kids who you know. There's the McKinney Vento law. Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. Follow up. Do you know where that falls in the budget? Um, I'm not sure if I have formally introduced myself. You know, I'm really, for the record, the licensed general interim director of the Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, <clears throat> that will be that would be a question for agency of education. Um, I think that it is something that economic services and DCF 
aware of and you know we're in touch with the agency of education if there are changes um coming that we will have to work with school districts on i mean in terms of some of your other questions for instance winston proudy right i mean this includes the operating cost for that site so it includes furniture for the space you know people will be moving into a space that has furniture that has the things to meet their basic needs they're the opening costs in that project. So um, the emergency apartments include, you know, the supplies. So some of those things are included in this, and then some of the things that you mentioned would not be. Okay. So and are not traditionally things that, that we fund through DCF. So that's not in this. No, I don't think so. I think it is funded <laughs> elsewhere, though. And one of the things that we do take into account when we're um, either placing people in a hotel or a shelter, or if we were moving people to a temporary shelter site, is we, we do try to um, give preference to those who have a connection to the community. We do like to disrupt um, children in particular in school systems uh, as little as possible when we make these moves. Yeah, I've seen that in my community and it's been really horrible for youth. Um, you know, and we've had some youth in my community who've spent years now living in a hotel, being shuffled around the state, and it's, it's really hard. Um, I'm going to ask one more time um, that I've asked this before, but um, my big, my biggest concern is if by April 1st this does not happen. Um, there's no other options for people. There is no housing. There is no place for people to go. So I'm just looking for reassurance that there is, that this will happen. And when we earlier, when mentioned, you know, shelter first state, is that means that you go to shelter first <clears throat> before hotel, not that we give shelter to everyone. That's correct. Uh, right. Housing first is something different. Right. And so, you know, we already in my community area have, as we all know, dozens of people being turned away when it's even this cold out. And I'm just really concerned about the, com the communities being able to embrace hundreds of people if this does not get done by April 1st and how that will will look for people and how as a policymaker I'll be able to to just be okay with that. Is there a question? No. Presno? Okay. I just I'm just trying to um, make sure that everybody I, my question talking. was what's the plan if it's not done by April 1st? Thank you. So I think we reassess our, our relationship with the hotels. I think um, we, we reassess uh, our shelters. Uh, are there other contingency plans for more congregate settings? I think is, is something we would have to consider. I do just wanna be clear that even if we do put together the number of temporary projects that we're talking about here, Still a significant shortfall uh, in the, the number of people that we need to that would be looking uh, for shelter. Thank you. That was the I, probably the point Representative Krasnow was was making. Um, so even just to clarify for people, even if we are successful, we being the global we putting together all of the temporary shelters and whatever else is on the line here, um, there's uh, still well over a thousand people who will be unsheltered. Um, Representative Howard and then Representative McGill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony here today. Um, the number of people in my community, which is Rutland, um, is quite high for um, people without homes. I visited one of the motels and to say it's deplorable is, I, I can't even describe how bad it was. Um, 
I don't understand why the state of Vermont owns property, owns the ASAP Bloomer building in downtown Rutland, where offices have moved out. The uh, Social Security office moved out over three years ago or more, empty. Another department, I can't remember the name, is moving out and renting from a private um, landowner. That building is pretty much empty. It has an empty restaurant downstairs on the ground floor that has been empty for years. As far as I know, it has showers in the basement. Um, they have uh, restrooms. Why isn't the state putting people in there temporarily instead of paying exorbitant amount of money for motels and hotels? These places, these spaces have been empty for years. Living in a motel, hotel is, is not, not ideal for anyone, but especially children. Thank you. I'm, that's my question. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Howard. And I, I agree with, with, um, with everything you said. I can tell you that we have looked at the Ace of Bloomer building. We looked at 108 Cherry Street. Uh, we're, we are looking at all available state properties. Um, it's expensive to retrofit some, you know, so it could be maybe, maybe temporary. You have to have a certain, uh, there are fire codes and certain sp sprinkler systems that are required for overnight occupancy. Uh, that was one of the big, most prohibitive things, I think, about both Cherry Street and the Ace of Bloomer building, but um, EGS can speak more specifically to that. We are looking at state properties and anything that we have available. If you have some others that I, I would love to connect with you, we've been actively engaged in, in Rutland trying to find spaces. Uh, I've had you know, some conversations with Rep McGuire. I'm in constant contact with the mayor. Uh, our field services director, Adam Sansick, is, is constantly trying to uh, find spaces in Rutland. We're, we're hopeful we can, and the, and the mayor has a, a longer term plan for a, a shelter, but that's not anything that's immediate. That's you know, part of the, the package that we're talking about for FY25. Um, but I'm, I'd love to talk to you about spaces that, that you might know are available in Rutland. Because these office spaces, they need to be cleaned, they need to be heated, they need to be air conditioned, and they're empty. And I'm sure a sprinkler system would be... Um, less expensive than spending the exorbitant amount of whatever it is, $135 a night per person? So it's a good question. And I, um, I don't have the, the construction knowledge, but what I have been hearing from, from BGS is that they are very expensive to retrofit, but as how it compares to hotel or to temporary solutions, you know, I'm not sure it might make sense. I'm thinking of BGS invitation. Maybe you should be in order. <laughs> Um, okay, um, Rep. Sam McGill, you're going to have the last question on this, and then we're going to invite the next witness. I Thank you. want to stay on the same slide. I was wondering, can you give us some um, information about how much you're budgeting per project? I, I, you know, I'm a huge advocate for having a menu of options. I'd like to see more beds created, but I'm really just trying to get a sense of kind of what the per bed cost is kind of for each of these different options. Um, and if you can't get that to me now, I understand, but an estimate would be good. Yeah, I can give you some estimates on, on the costs, although it seems to be always changing um, as we get um, quotes back from vendors. You are so, uh, Winston Prouty, the total cost was, do you have that, really? It's um, <clears throat> approximately $950,000. Okay. And does that include services it for that their term? staffing. Okay, yeah. awesome. Both salary and operating. Um, they also are our family support housing provider down there. So they're going to be, you know, we anticipate that there'll be a lot of crossover in that population. So they'll be able to leverage that as well. Um, for Paths of Community Action, it's $87,000. Um, Sorry, I missed just that number. 87000 Okay, That's just the apartment okay. cost. They are able to leverage 
um, housing counselors that they have through their sort of standard base HAP grant yeah. to address this capacity um, so that the services will come separately from, from that. Um, and so, I, yeah, those, I mean, those are the two that, that I can speak to as the commissioner said, some of these are, are kind of in negotiating, in okay. negotiation. Um, and it's too preliminary to, to share based on that bid and RFP process. And, and looking at the time frame, you know, the, the cost per bed will be different, but we can give you the calculation on the cost per bed. I will say with the armory, it's, it's um, the big expense is gonna be the staffing. Okay. And we have RFPs that, that run the gamut for, for 90 days, uh, I think. So the purchase the, price is also 890,000. Right, that's, and that's a long-term asset for the state after this temporary use. So we're actually, we're not building that into the cost per bed, but it, you know, fair enough. And then there are some um, renovation retrofit to make it available for occupancy overnight. So that's like the sprinklering and, and things like that that may be built into the cost or BGS is gonna absorb that for future use. Um, and then on the mobile units, um, we're looking at different, whether we purchase the units and own them or um, a provider purchases them and provides the service along with it, or we do a rental lease. Um, so those are all kind of kind of various, but a, a number that has been kind of floated out there that may not be terribly accurate. So please don't hold me to it. It's about a million dollars per site for 90 days. And so, you know, a lot of these are as expensive or more expensive than a hotel. They do come with services um, and they do uh, disrupt the hotel motel model and provide us with some different options um, to provide us with some negotiation leverage. And just the thing that I would leave the committees with is, you know, I, I these are, oh, there's a lot of short-term uh, problems to solve. Uh, I would love to be in this seat next year and know that there are a lot more housing units and a smaller problem to, to solve. Uh, I know the interim is the part that we really have to have a lot more conversation over while we're building out that the rest of that system. Um, but Commissioner Farrell and others will come and talk to you about unit generation. Uh, and the more units that we can have, we think the more successfully we'll move people more quickly through these temporary solutions that we have propped up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Winters and Deputy Commissioner and Director. Um, we appreciate you being here. Um, we know it's a tough job. Um, and um, I, I would love for you to be continuing to sit there next year. So <laughs> um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Farrell, Commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development. And I think uh, Sean and Nate as well. Uh, I don't know. He's not, not here. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, is Commissioner Bolio here? Yes, Laura. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. This is, this is very humorous. You have to bring your own chair. <laughs> I missed the, the first time in my years I've ever seen that. But it's very funny. This test just <laughs> I know this whole year, that is representative of the whole year. Bring your own chair with us. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here. No, no, we're good. Okay. Make faces. Um, <laughs> as you're leaving, please, could you could keep it down or as uh, we'd, we'd like to hear from the witnesses. Um, so thank you for being here and um, we uh, appreciate your attention. And um, I just, want to make sure that uh, people understand that we also have um, three other witnesses after you that we want to make sure we have time. So I'm just, that's more of a notation to committee members in terms of making your questions kind of succinct. That would be great. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Wood, Chair Stevens. Good to see everybody. A lot of familiar faces here. Um, I'm in awkwardly flanked by Commissioner Bolio and Director Gilpin. Um, they're going to touch on a couple of things. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll set the stage. Um, and but, you know, the reason they're here is because what I'm going to be talking about is more the, the long term vision. Right. I I can't make any promises about permanent units that are going to come online to solve this this April one issue or even a July one issue. But we can talk about what we need to do over the next five, 10 years so that the people that are sitting in all of our seats 10 and 15 years from now aren't kicking us and saying, boy, I wish Commissioner Farrell did something about this housing problem. So um, I also want to point out that the tools that we're going to talk about today 
are a couple of those in the tool belt. Commissioner Bolio is going to talk about some tools that are being proposed. Those are also not the only things being proposed. There are many things, but we wanted to give a flavor of the way we can leverage public and private capital to make sure that we're we're making bringing everybody into this. Can I interrupt just for a moment? I just want to make sure that uh, you have not submitted anything in advance because uh, I don't see it on our web pages. Yeah, we we won't be submitting any. We may submit VHIP data, I suppose, but we do, we have nothing to share. Okay, I, I see. We do have something from Commissioner Bolio. I have a one page wrong one. I see it. Yes, okay. that is there. It's so. going to be impossible to see on the screen, so I'll probably just speak to it. But it is available. People can call it up. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't missing something that had been sent in. No, no, that's okay. And uh, I guess, you know, as I get started here, for the record, uh, Alex Farrell, Commissioner at the Department of Housing and Community Development. So, um, you know, and like I said, I'm in, I'm in the position where while you all are, are very much focused on this emergency, I have to look five, 10 years down the road. And I have to use the data available from, from Vermont, but also in other jurisdictions, what has worked and what, um, what needs help from other resources. Um, and what that means is in my seat, I cannot separate homelessness from the broader housing issue. Uh, and there's a lot of data that shows us why that is. Um, and I can touch on that in a minute. Um, you'll also hear me say that this is gonna to have to be a layered approach. You will never hear me say that Act 250 reform alone is gonna solve the problem. Nor will you hear me say zoning reform alone is gonna solve the problem or appeals reform or just state investment or just incentives to leverage private investment. I will never say any of those things alone will solve this. You will hear me say we have to do all of them to solve this problem. Um, you know, I think I, Chris Donnelly said something that I've said a couple of times and I just really appreciate, there's a lot of folks saying this, we are not in danger of overbuilding anytime soon. The, the efforts we make to increase production of homes and the investments we make there are not going to push us too far in the other direction because we are so far behind and we've done it to ourselves over decades. I'll share some more data there in a moment. Um, so this, decades of underproduction, the population we're discussing today are most harmed by that underproduction. In every jurisdiction where this has been studied, the people who are most harmed by low production and low vacancy rates are the most vulnerable, the, the homeless and the people that are on SSDI. Um, so we know that programs like uh, VHIP that have received substantial funding and, and you know, VHIP is a new tool in the tool belt that has been bringing units online at a pace and a cost that we weren't benefiting from prior to March of 2020. And so we've got that great benefit now. But just, just like with the layered approach to regulatory reform and, and uh, appeals reform and all of this, um, VHIP alone also will be the tool. VHCB, VHFA with the low-income housing tax credit. These are all tools that work together, community development block grants. And so as we're thinking about how we make investments, we also need to think about how the state leverages federal investment as well. Um, so Director Gilpin in a moment is gonna dive a little bit more into VHIP, the data that we have thus far, and then what we expect from VHIP going forward. And, and luckily Chris Donnelly teed some of that up. Um, but what we have observed is that even after historic investments, 500 million over the last three years, that didn't get us where we needed to be. It's getting us a lot of the way, and that's because of partners like VHCB and CHT. Um, it's also because of the work VHIP is doing. But we have just had the greatest test case in the history of our state that proved that investment alone, far beyond the state's means, will just not do it. We need investment along with many other things. So the reason I am you know really working hard to share this message and make it clear that um vacancy rates and and high rents are most negatively impacting folks at the lower end of the economic spectrum is because a there's data to support it and b this is really finally starting to gain wider acceptance and i'm sure 
a lot of folks have seen the publicity that the, the book uh, how, uh, Homelessness is a Housing Issue has gotten. Um, that has made a lot of this data more, more widely known and accepted and, and has you know, reaffirmed a lot of what we're saying that it's gotta be a multi-layered approach and expanding the whole stock is really important, especially for folks at this lower end of the economic, um, economic spectrum. And it's also easy. I know we probably hear in the news, folks want to point to substance use disorder, want to point to mental health and say, the, these are the reasons for our homelessness issue. It's not. It's certainly not the driving factor. They're complicating factors that make it a lot more challenge, challenging to make sure these folks get into a better place. They are complicating factors, not the driving factor. And frankly, um, there's evidence to su suggest that nor is poverty the driving factor. It is what leads to somebody being more at risk for homelessness, but the scarcity in a region or a city is what drives the, those homelessness rates. You can compare Detroit and San Francisco, for example. There is a far worse homelessness rate in San Francisco than in Detroit, largely because Detroit has had other problems, but those problems have led to, despite a worse poverty rate, more vacancies. Um, there are dozens of other cases that can that can highlight this, so I won't dive into all of them. But the best way to combat homelessness in the wrong in the long run is going to be to increase the supply. Now, I'm I'm going to quickly before we pivot to more tangibly the tool we are using right now, VHIP, and then um, just a couple examples of proposals uh, from from Commissioner Bolio. I, I just want to cite something that VHFA. Uh, put in a recent post that I think summarizes sort of the, the Vermont situation well. Um, and, and they said in, in most counties in Vermont, the number of people experiencing homelessness increased between 22 and 23. Not a, sh not a surprise with the greatest increase in Rutland County. Um, meanwhile, the number of building permits issued each year in Vermont has stagnated at about 2,300 homes. It stayed flat at about that for 21 and 22 and was far lower in the years before that. Um, the HUD median rent estimates for Vermont counties continued increasing at an annual pace of 5%, and statewide rental vacancy rates are below the 5% threshold considered to be a healthy vacancy rate. And any of the other measures that we discussed today that don't focus on permanently increasing the supply of housing in Vermont are one aspect of what we need to discuss here. Because like I said before, the people in our seats 10 years from now are going to kick us if we didn't also look at that total supply. And I just, I wanna share one last data point for when I think of this decades in the making, we should have seen this coming, we should have been doing things sooner. Um, I'm gonna just talk a bit about the, uh, the units permitted by decade. So in the eighties, the average number of units permitted uh, per year um, was almost 3,900 units per year. Um, just so folks know, that actually peaked right around 88, 89. Um, then in the 90s, that average came down from 3,900 units uh, to, in the 90s, it was about 2,800 units average per year. Um, in the early 2000s, it came up slightly from that roughly 2,300 to about um, 2,500 per year in the early 2000s. And then from 2010 to 2019, the average number of units permitted during that decade was 1,600 units. So decade after decade, we slowly produced less and less. And here we are now talking about a, an absolute crisis. Um, now, 2020 to 2022, um, so just essentially the, the last three years that we have data for, there was a slight uptick in each of those years that got us to that roughly 2,300 that we saw in 2022. So about 2,200 units on average during those years. And we know that some of that was a benefit of substantial public investment. But again, we're talking about a $500 million investment that we're not gonna be able to do again in that short of a time. Perhaps as Chris laid out a case over a number of years, we can find ways to be strategic about our investments. We also need to be clear-eyed and realistic about what our capacity as a state and how we can increase that. And I'm gonna make one final point before I pass it off to Sean, which is the reason these layered reforms are beneficial 
things like <clears throat> things like uh, zoning reform, appeals reform, um, Act 250 reform, incentives to leverage private capital. When you stack them all and then we re remove these arbitrary caps, the cost per unit on a construction ba basis might not change, but the average cost can decrease because it's about scale. If we're capping the number of units that can be built in a certain area, that's say 29 before triggering Act 250 and adding other costs. Well, developers are going to stop there. They're gonna just build to what's gonna be just enough before they hit that cap. And we're gonna lose out on all kinds of units that we really can't count. Perhaps that developer could have built 80 units on that same square footage. We are doing this to ourselves and in some ways we can quantify it, in some ways we can't. It's hard to prove a negative, right? Um, so I just, I just wanna say, it's not that we can save costs because you save on the Act 250 application, you're losing out on scale because all those fixed costs, all the infrastructure you have to go in to put that building in, you need to spread that over more units. And if we're not letting developers spread it over more units, we are driving up the per unit cost. So that's where you can drive that cost down, not just from the savings from a permit. Anyway, why don't we pass it to Sean? Actually, oh, sure. why, don't, why don't we take a moment to um, take questions for you and then we'll pass it to Sean. Um, Chair Stevens and I uh, are gonna take the prerogative of being at the head of the table and asking a couple ourselves. Um, so the first one, I, I am delighted to hear you say that you'll never hear you say that Act 250 reform alone will solve this problem. Um, delighted to hear you say that. And I'm delighted to hear you say that I have to look five to 10 years down the road, you know, for the people sitting in your seats 10 years from now. What I'm not delighted to hear, because we haven't heard it, is an actual plan. Um, you know, we saw from uh, our previous witness this morning that they actually have thought about what it would take to serve very low income people. The trickle down effect, you know, of, you know, let's build a bunch of, you know, housing in general. I've been, uh, I'll be honest, I've been frustrated that we've put $500 million plus into this and we have not focused sufficiently on people of very low incomes. And um, so uh, I don't see a plan coming from you. I don't see something on the table um, that says we need X number of units every year um, to, to do this. And like you said, Permit reform is not going to be sufficient to do this. We are going to need an influx. And even if we don't have sufficient funds, so even if, you know, the administration says, you know, we're not going to raise taxes to do this or we're not going to have some other kind of income, it's still, I believe, the responsibility to say what it is that we need, even if we're not able to fund it at this point in time. And um, that, honestly, is just something I have not seen. Um, and, you know, maybe you have that, um, uh, but we would, we would love to see that. Um, so, um, is there a question there about Jim? No. Do you have such a plan about how many units, how much it would cost? What, uh, that, that is my question. Thank you, Chair Seats. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Um, and, and, you know, to be clear, the legislation we proposed was based on the plan that we have. So for starters, um, we, we actually agree with VHFA's assessment that um, if by 2030, we are able to produce 30 to 40,000 units. So what that works out to be is that the building permit numbers I was sharing with you need to be between 4,700 and 5,500 per year to hit that. That would start getting us to healthy vacancy rates. I'm sure some of you tuned in and saw our presentations during the fall about mm -hmm. the unit deficits and you saw how we walked through by region what the vacancy rates are by ownership and by rental. And then you saw that we talked about how many units we need to get to those healthy vacancy rates. So that's the starting point, right? I think you're saying we've assessed the problem, but what you're not seeing is, is the plan to get there. So um, our, our estimates based on what we proposed, we think are a good step in the right direction, though we recognize political realities make it tough to um, you know, pin down something that everyone can agree upon and we think meets the needs. Anytime you put out a projection, folks are going to quibble about what's the number. Why do you say 10% increase versus 60% increase? So for example, if we're able to estimate based on what uh, Minneapolis's reforms did, 
uh, that got them roughly 13, 15% ongoing increase. There were some years immediately after their reforms that got them higher than that, but assuming those are anomalies, the 15% increase is a basis. So when we recommend stacking reforms, we can then use that data to assume uh, a certain layered effect. I think it's reasonable to assume that the H719 uh, stacked reforms, for example, would result in production between 4,200 units per year and 4,900 units per year. That would get us back to that late 80s production. That is what needs to happen in order to meet this need. The reason there's also <clears throat> included in that investment in things like VHIP, in things like other incentives, and the, the administration continues to fund VHCB is because you are right. Those complement this broader approach. And I, I, I understand what you're you know, pointing to with this trickle down. This is not my theory. This is experts who have studied this for decades. I, I am simply pointing to the correlation between vacancy rates and uh, rates of homelessness. And we are also saying we need to continue to invest in things like VHIP and VHCB that are going to ensure that there are specifically those units as well. Okay, I'm uh, going to call in Chair Stevens, Elder, and then Gregoire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you did use this word, Commissioner, um, are we in a crisis? Uh, certainly. Why haven't we called a state of emergency then? That's beyond my... I mean, <laughs> is it being discussed at any level in, in this building of saying we've been discussing a housing crisis an unhoused crisis, a middle income housing crisis. We have this, this number of 40,000 units unattainable in our current state. And yet we're not calling for a state of emergency, which is something we cannot do as a legislature and as a general mm -hmm. assembly. So the political reality is that we are going to sit and talk in meetings like this and in meetings in our individual rooms and talk about what we should be doing, and yet we're not doing it for political realities. And one of those is, does the administration have the stomach to propose $200 million of additional income simply for a 10-year plan Never mind the services, never mind middle income, never mind the other areas of, of school construction, never mind the other needs, some of which have been papered over with federal money through a crisis, which I believe we're still in the middle of. Does this administration have the stomach to consider raising $200 million a year for the next 10 years to putting their heads down and figuring out where we're going to find that money and how, and be frank with us and be frank with the public, that talking about what we need ends up just being a Sisyphean effort because we've, we have studies that show us for years and years and years what we need. We understand here in this building what we need. Are we willing to make the investment? Is the administration willing to put forward a plan to fund something like a 10-year housing plan to fund a 10-year um, school construction plan? I think there are a few questions in there. Uh, I don't know about a school construction plan. But specifically for housing, yes. we had a proposal today for $200 million a year that would provide at least two and perhaps three of the schools of dealing with low-income housing and um, including some of the stuff we'll hear from, from Sean. It, but the question is, in the end, will we be able to raise the money and are we looking for a way, are we, Vermont, looking for a way to fund it? Because I've been talking about this for 15 years and we haven't achieved it. Is that my failure? There is part of a collective failure. And I think the, the failure to address how we would actually do this, now we have a number in front of us today. Is the administration willing to address the need for investing $200 million in low-income housing over the next 10 years? I think that investment contemplates keeping the current structure exactly the same. And the plan that we laid out indicates that we can make the investment go further, that we don't necessarily need to go to that level, $2 billion over 10, 10 years. We can make a significant investment, but we can make a smaller investment if we make the hard choices, make the structural change that's needed. 
And was there a down payment in the budget proposal to BHCB and to other housing agencies, or was that missing this year? The, the budget does have BHCB included. Sufficient? <laughs> That's not my call. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. I asked him if that was sufficient. Oh, okay. All right, All right. thank you. All right, thank you. Representative Elder, Gregoire, and then Bartley. We thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, I am going to follow up on a bill that you did, did talk to us about, not in too much detail, but this is Bill 686 that basically asks us to sort of measure as we go mm -hmm. against these goals. So whether the goal is you know, 5,500 units a year, 30,000 units over five years, whatever the goal is, to say, let's see if we're hitting some interstitial benchmarks that are mm -hmm. um, appropriate, you know, realistic. And, and um, so... Without getting more into that, one thing that came up from your testimony, or actually your your uh, contractor's testimony, is that we have this part of Act 47, S100 that we passed, that says upon publication of the statewide housing needs assessment, we also have to have accompanying regional targets. Mm -hmm. And then we heard testimony that said, actually, we don't know if we can do that because the statewide housing needs ass assessment isn't necessarily a targets thing. It's a projections thing. And anyway, it's county based, not regions based. I'll leave it at that. But that we're going to revisit that. Um, clearly, you are required to publish those targets, um, whether or not the HUD maps make it easy to do so. So I'm just kind of curious, do you have a plan to publish those targets? And, and we don't have to go super in the weeds of it, but can you connect it to this idea of the kind of 5,000-ish homes a year? And yep. Because I want to see some kind of, um, I do want to see not just projections, but targets, and then I want to see measure as we go kind of accountability, yep. which I know is hard, you know, but um, if you could just speak to how your department plans to create those statutorily required targets <laughs> along with the housing needs assessment, that would be really helpful. Yeah, the way we did it was we um, did a layered contract with VHFA. So we have a contract with them to complete the housing needs assessment, which is the requirement. And then we worked with the RPCs and VHFA to pair up to set those other targets for it. I believe 2040 and 2050, is that what? Yes. Yeah, so so um, we acknowledge the need to do both separately. Uh, and then we coordinated the RPCs to make sure that we can make that happen. You know, the statute says you have to do them both together. Well, we legally can't do them together, so to speak, because we have to have a submission to HUD. Right. Uh, they're going to be done as part of the same project, if you know what I mean. So the same insights that are coming from the housing needs assessment will be part of the this mm -hmm. broader targets. But our housing needs assessment is going to kind of point out, and, and again, Act 47 talked about 2030. We don't want to wait for goals in 2040 and 2050. And so I do, I, I thought in some ways your testimony kind of let me know that, um, or, or made me infer, and maybe I've got this wrong, but that actually we've asked for something that maybe your department can't do in Act 47. And I want to drill down on that because um, setting targets along with the current statewide housing needs assessment was a very clear goal of that of that legislation. And sometimes we have to re revisit these things and yeah. say, oh, actually, you know, the, you know, the, Square peg isn't going to fit in the round hole here, you know, but but we need to have clarity on that because, for example, the Bill 686 that I won't get further into, it is building on on a presumption of what is in statute. And yet we're hearing that mm, we're not going to actually accomplish the plain English of what the statute sets out. Um, I, I think I'm trying to I think we are achieving that. Um, it's not. It's not that we're going to change the housing needs assessment to do that. It's that we're adding this on top of the housing assessment. Now, from my seat, that is effectively no different for you all because you're getting the same information. Whether we give HUD something different shouldn't matter to, to the General Assembly because they'll still get all the information. We just have to parse out what HUD gets. Right. Director Gopin, do you want to? Yeah, I'd say it's the same deliverable. Um, so there are or we are putting it together. Functionally. Okay. Yeah. Just as long as they come out contemporaneously. Yeah. And I won't belabor that any further. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Representative Gregoire and then Bartley, and then I want to make sure that your other presenters have an opportunity. So that's yeah. the last two questions for you for right now. Anyway. Okay. And, and then, I, sorry, just a moment. Sure. Um, I, I do want to make note of the time, you know, we're at um, nearly 20 to 12 and uh, we want to make sure that we have time for particularly the pathways folks um, before we break, uh, cause they've come a long distance and, um, uh, and um, the Center for Mount Habitat for Humanity is going to be today. Going to be today after lunch in House General and Housing. Um, so, um, uh, so <clears throat> any member of my committee that wants to join that, not any member, because I need a quorum in my committee. But <laughs> <laughs> just, just um, any, not every. Yeah, <laughs> um, that would be great. So I just want to, uh, you know. Uh, sorry, there's just been a lot of questions. As you know, this is a this is just something that we are struggling greatly with here, and I we know that everyone is doing the same. So, uh, Representative Gregoire, um, interest of time, I will pare my question and comments down. Um, I appreciate use of science to discuss this issue and in, in studies and economics. Um, we know, well, I think some people know and some don't, but um, that scale matters. Um, so, but I just want to ask this question, I guess. I have a lot more to say about the whole issues of, of all everything that works together. But if the legislature is finally willing to come to the table in good faith, is the governor willing to come to the table in good faith as well? Oh, certainly. Okay. Okay. I won't add to that. <laughs> Representative Bartley. I mean, thank you two sides of your story. Exactly. And thank you for being here today. Um, I just want to make sure... I'm hearing correctly and understanding correctly that you're not implying that Act 250 reform is the only solution to the crisis. And I think we all around this table and in this room agree that this is a crisis, um, but it's just one aspect of the recommendation that you're making, which yes. is also why the governor's recommendation was formed in an omnibus bill. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think we're going to pivot now to Mr. Gilpin. Sounds to go first. Me um, first. Sure. Why don't we do Sean first? Is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Gilpin, uh, Housing Division Director at the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, I'll try to be brief, and certainly um, I'm I'm not difficult to find. So uh, feel free to reach out to me afterwards for follow-ups. And there's an awful lot of uh, information up on our website as well. Um, it gets updated regularly, including some statistics. Um, but VHIP, the uh, Vermont Housing Improvement Program, um, is uh, a really uh, a really exciting and and frankly very impressive partnership um, between us and the five home ownership centers um, throughout the state. So it covers the, the in, the, all the regions of the state. Um, it's a program by which uh, we provide through the home ownership centers um, relatively small grants to private property owners in order to reinvest in. Um, vacant and underutilized uh, properties to bring um, the idea is a, it's a rehabilitation project to take some of these um, old blighted buildings, bring them back up to code and put them into service um, as rental housing. Um, the program has uh, matured and evolved over time. Um, it started out at the very end of 2020 um, as the rehousing recovery program. It was actually funded with CARES Act dollars um, and then was put into statute um, the, the following year um, and has been funded with ARPA um, to date. And so we get uh, quarterly reports from the home ownership centers. Um, and uh, as, of, um, as of their report on January 1, um, so from the beginning of the program to January 1 of this calendar year, we've brought 535 units online. Um, over 90% of those are serving people exiting homelessness. Um, the there are an additional, as we speak, 383, 86 units um, in the pipeline um, right now. Uh, I fully expect that we'll exceed 400 units this calendar year, um, and we'll probably be on pace to continue that for the following calendar year as well. Um, there are, uh, yeah, there are a number of um, there are there are a number of program parameters that we apply to this outside of just what's in the statute. But what has been done um, up to up to this point has been a focus primarily, as was noted earlier, primarily on um, rehousing the homeless, um, and that is in large part um, because of uh, the statutory um, 
directive to do so, um, as well as the uh, the funding mechanism, which has been uh, COVID relief dollars, which we needed to show to the feds that there was a direct nexus to um, alleviating COVID. And uh, our, our argument was that um, uh, removing people from um, congregate shelters was was a necessary um, move to make. So the um, the program as it's been run um, to date, uh, or at least most recently, I won't go over so, all the history because um, we have ratcheted up the requirements on property owners over time. But um, as of this date, uh, a property owner can apply for um, up to thirty thousand dollars per unit um, for a two bedroom or below uh, uh, rehabilitation. A uh, three bedroom and above um, can uh, be eligible for up to fifty thousand dollars in grant funds. Um, and then any new uh, new unit construction. So if you're converting a commercial building, an office building, something like that, if you're um, dividing a single family home into multiple units, each one of those net new units could be eligible for up to that fifty thousand. Um, there is a twenty percent match requirement um, on behalf of the property owners. We have seen that just be completely exceeded in absolutely every every project. So we're really finding out that um, and our average grant amounts. Um, is $38,600. So for $38,600 in public investment, we're getting new mm -hmm. units online. And these units um, are required to be uh, rented at HUD fair market rent rates, which is the amount that a Section 8 uh, housing choice voucher can pay, um, is allowed to pay um, for a minimum of five years. Um, and they must be rented to somebody um, who's been referred by the coordinated entry lead organization or a refugee resettlement organization. There's been a handful of those, but it's by and large been um, homeless providers. Now, we're about to go through a pretty exciting transition in this program that's going to broaden it dramatically. Um, we are almost fully obligated all of the ARPA dollars that were spent. Um, and at the end of next week, we're actually going to be pausing applications at all five homeownership centers to give us a moment to um, institute new rules that actually live up to the full um, aperture that was allowed in the statute. And so there will essentially be two different tracks that a property owner is um, entitled to take. One um, maintains that five-year affordability level and the homeless service component, um, or an alternative track would be a 10-year affordability um, affordability timeframe without the homeless service component. So one uh, property owner could rent to um, uh, ideally tenants at 80% area median income or below um, for that 10 year period. Um, and there is, I will say, um, just the one last thing. Um, we are asking um, to actually uh, move to all of these grants being um, forgivable loans. Um, and that is a tax implication for all intents and purposes. They function, it's a zero interest deferred payment um, uh, loan that's forgiven on a percentage basis each year um, so that by the end of the compliance period, it's been completely forgiven. What we've found is that um, people getting this lump sum um, is causing some tax issues with some individuals um, because that's considered taxable income in that tax year. Um, we understand that on the federal level, if it's a forgivable loan, it will only be considered, only the uh, amount of the loan that's forgiven in that year will be considered taxable income, which will make it uh, dramatically easier. Although we encourage everyone to seek out uh, private uh, tax uh, assistance, you know, figuring that out, we don't provide any of that guidance, but um, I'll stop there. I, I could talk about this program all day, um, but uh, it, it is, it has done an incredible amount uh, of, uh, you know, just unit creation, but also um, anecdotally, we're hearing a lot of connectivity between um, local property owners and service providers that they weren't aware of before, and actually seeing sort of organically a better, um, better communication in that housing ecosystem in the places this has been, um, this has been utilized. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just want to make. Would you state again the move that the the ten percent? It seemed like that would be removing the requirement to. Um, assist people with uh, who are facing homelessness or are homeless. Yeah, so that that will be an option that that doesn't have that requirement. Um, these are competitive um, competitive grants, so it's not a first come first serve. We do you know we we work with the homeownerships to prioritize. Um, so as as we have no idea what the um, application applications are going to look like once this option is is out there. We actually started the program in the CARES Act. Um, without any homelessness requirement other than to at least receive referrals from a coordinated um, or from part of the continuum of care. Um, 
we actually found that you know several uh, landlords took it up um, and the, the program was still well subscribed and we actually ramped up and said that um, for the latter half of the cares and that all of the ARPA to date has been that homeless requirement and we have not seen the numbers go down. Um, I expect as was noted, we're probably getting a lot of the low hanging fruit. So um, in order to keep the, the program, you know, bringing on as many units online as possible, um, you know, we want to go to the full statutory um, parameters um, because uh, there has been a concerted effort among our home ownership centers to maintain, be sure that we maintain, um, and we we want to do that as well, maintain a, a large portion of this program being focused on homeless service provision, but also want to expand it to um, other, you know, low income unit creation just to, to you know, bring bring new units online. But but that five year option still still, does still have yeah. the requirement. Yeah, I understand. So I just want to make um, I guess my question is, will you be delineating a certain amount for each? Or are you just going to be managing this as, as one budget? It would be easier for us to manage as one budget when we start delineating amounts. It gets very because we're working with five different um, five different organizations and they all would have to figure out their allocations for the private. So it, it, beco it becomes really cumbersome. Okay. Um, we could set general. I mean, I'm, I would be more than happy to put in our policy log and our, our um, policy documents that were we have targets for certain percentages. I guess what. Um, OK, uh, so. I other people need to ask questions. Uh, we're just going to take a couple of questions. I do have concerns that that's going to reduce the number and the um, focus yes. on people experiencing homelessness. And again, refocus on the trickle down effect, which, um, you know, we see is not necessarily um, beneficial for quick access, fast access, as you have proven that can happen. So, you know, thank you for, for that. Um, yes, Representative Chestnut Tangerman. Thank you. Um, so my understanding of, of the VHIP program is that it has had uh, a lot of success all around the state, Correct. rural areas, as well as uh, what we call urban. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to confirm the, the size of the projects. Are they primarily, I, mean, I understand they're multi-unit projects, but less than five? Or can you clarify who is using Who's applying for and using the grants? Yeah, it, it definitely varies by region. Um, you know, we see some more sophisticated um, operators in the Chittenden County area, you know, Northwest area. Um, but by and large, I'd say it's probably about a half and half split. I, you know, I don't have the, the exact um, data in front of me, but it's probably about a half and a half split of below five unit structures and above. Um, but a lot of, and as the program has aged, we've seen more and more um, smaller uh, landlords get involved. I think it's as sort of the word's gotten out and they've seen some of the other operators in, in town be able to uh, utilize it effectively, um, that, that it's, it's continuing to um, yeah, spread around, around the communities in small, small. And is it being used by, you know, just average person wanting to do an ADU on the property or? Yes, um, we actually have, uh, we've completed 13 ADUs um, as of January 1 and there are 54 in the pipeline. Um, and we're actually working, we've worked a little bit, we're, we're always trying to braid resources. So we work with um, the weatherization crew to try to figure out how to up referrals there. Um, we've also had some conversations with some of the credit unions and the Realtors Association to talk about um, whether this could be considered a potential piece of equity going into a home purchase um, so that you could purchase a home and with the intention of building an ADU for affordability reasons. Um, so there, there are a lot of um, opportunities there. And I, I will point out that the, um, there's a great deal of data on your website. You can see for your own regions um, who actually by individual and how much they received um, for what quantity of unit um, right at the HIP website. So thank you for that um, transparency in data. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, uh, Representative Barrows. Burrows. Sorry, I said Barrows. Burrows. <laughs> thank you. Um, we talked last week about... Uh, uh, the, when the clock starts ticking on the five year, um, can you just reiterate for, uh, for example, our chair wasn't there and none yeah. of these kind people from human services weren't here, so. Sure, and so that clock does start ticking at the 
date the unit goes into service. Not so the lease date the and not the PCCT. not the grant agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and we've okay. we've clarified that with um with with Downstreet. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. you doing that. Yeah. And we um we actually um we found uh, another interesting piece of data. So um the average time between grant agreement and unit lease up is 197 days. So we're talking about six and a half months. Um which is again, you know, the 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 speed and the um, fiscal F efficiency of this program is is pretty. Wow, that is really different from what was suggested last week, which was I think eighteen months. So there there was an eighteen month deadline um, that we that we put in place because we didn't want people to to dawdle on things. Um, but we found that that most of these projects are are being completed within uh, within an eight month time period. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move to um, Commissioner Bolio. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, Craig Bolio, Tax Commissioner. Uh, you heard Commissioner Farrell talk about, you know, the holistic package, including uh, regulatory reform, investment, and uh, incentives. So I'm here to talk about some of those incentives that are uh, accounted for in the uh, governor's recommended budget and also part of the, uh, the, the governor's housing package that's uh, outlined in H719. Uh, there's three of them, and I'll touch on, on each of them briefly, right? So the, the first is a property value freeze for new construction and restoration of blighted residential property. The second is a property transfer tax exemption when purchasing blighted property that will be restored, residential property that will be restored for use. And the third, hello. Wow. And the, third, <laughs> and the, uh, the third is is an increase to the base in the downtown and village center tax credit cap from 3 million to 5 million annually. Right, and just at a high level, right? Why are tax incentives part of the solution? And I think for my chair, it's because when they're used correctly, they can be a very focused and effective tool to leverage uh, public dollars to spur private investment without a lot of overhead and administrative costs, right? So I'll, I'll go through the, the, the value freeze uh, briefly first. So it's a five-year freeze uh, for freezing the property value of either newly constructed or rehabbed residential dwellings at their pre-improvement value. So maybe it's a plot of land and that's the pre-improvement value. Maybe it's the depressed value of a blighted property that's going to get restored. And there are rules around the proposal to make sure that it's really targeted, right? So it's only available in certain areas, designated downtowns, village centers, neighborhood development areas, and then a federal designation, uh, new market tax credit areas. Uh, it can, it's only available for properties that will be used as either owner occupied homesteads or long term rentals. So, not second homes, not short term rentals. And it requires occupancy. It requires the certification and proof of that occupancy happening initially and on an annual basis to continue to get that exemption. And if you do not meet those qualifications, you pay back all of the exemption you previously got with interest. So if for two years you qualified, and then in the third year you stop qualifying, you owe it all back, right? So it's really to make sure that folks are going to be doing what they say for the entire five-year period if they want to take this. Uh, there's an initial and annual certification process through the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. This freeze uh, applies to the education property tax value, right? So what I'm describing, folks may recognize municipalities can already do through a similar mechanism called tax stabilization agreements. The big challenge that they have is that uh, they can either only offer that for the municipal share of property taxes, or they could offer it for a property's share of the education tax, but then the town has to make up that education tax on the rest of their property taxpayers. So what we're talking about here is the state having some skin in the game to say, hey, you can offer a, a similar a, a incentive and exemption without the town having to make up for the rest of that. Additionally, towns can opt into this specific program if they want to, because it should be easier to manage than a tax stabilization group. But it's not a requirement. That's a town by town vote. Um, then rehab uh, qualifies if it actually meets certain definitions of blighted and has uh, certain uh, levels of investment on it, right? So that's 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 sort of the, the big first one, and and we're we're basing it on programs that we've seen around the country, right? Not only existing Vermont law that offers very similar options for municipalities to use today that I think are underutilized because of the impact of the statewide education tax but very similar programs we see in localities all around the country in, I think about a dozen states. 
Um, and so this is this is really a, a program that is a, a type of program that's been out there uh, uh, doing uh, doing good things. The property transfer tax exemption. So briefly, that is uh, an, a property transfer tax is paid on the transfer of real property in Vermont, usually paid by the buyer. So this would be an exemption for buyers who are purchasing blighted property with a certification that they will uh, rehab it so that it can be used again for owner-occupied homesteads or long-term rentals within three years. And again, to keep that exemption, they have to show us. They have to either, the property has to have a homestead declaration on it or a landlord certificate that shows it's a long-term rental. And if they don't, we claw it back. Uh, that's available statewide, not just designated areas, uh, because you want to be able to rehab blighted property anywhere. Um, and, and both of these have uh, a very modest price tag attached to them when you look at uh, the existing activity that would get exemptions, right? And so if we do our jobs well here in this area, what you'd see is uh, hopefully down the line, when you start to calculate the tax expenditure, it would be much higher than the projection today because we're talking about the forecasts and the projections and the activity that happens today compared to what could happen if we were to, to uh, do all of the reforms that we're talking about, but these uh, specific incentives. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Bolio. We're actually not going to take any questions. You are the lucky one um, <laughs> end of the road um, because we want to make sure in the next 15 minutes that we have time to devote to the Pathways folks um, who have come a long ways. So um, we appreciate your time and attention here. And obviously this is not going to, it's not going to be the end of our time together. Um, so it's been very helpful. I know particularly for, for uh, our committee and human services to hear some of the um, other things, more details on that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We're going to hear uh, now from Pathways, Maria and Cheryl. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> And just as a reminder, the um, Habitat for Humanity Center Vermont Habitat is going to be this afternoon after lunch, which is now abbreviated. Right. Fast food. Welcome and thank you for traveling all the way here. You traveled to some distance and thank you for being here in person. We really appreciate it. So please just introduce yourself for the record and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Maria Moore, Director of Development and Communications for Pathways Vermont. And I'm Cheryl Jackins, I am the Housing Program Director for Pathways Vermont. So, yes. Um, there, the information that's been shared with the committee is this uh, one page document that I think might be going up on the screen. Um, they're figuring that out now. So um, I, I'll just give a really brief overview of Pathways. Um, Pathways Vermont has been providing a variety of programs and services throughout the state since 2010, it started as a pilot program for Housing First in 2009 in Chittenden County and has since um, expanded in terms of where Housing First is currently offered and in other core programs that we offer. Um, we work with individuals who are experiencing homelessness, mental health challenges, and are involved with corrections, to name a few populations. Uh, we provide innovative mental health alternatives, use a peer approach in all of our programs, and value the lived experience of our staff members and our program participants. Um, so as I mentioned, our first and largest program is Housing First. We is up behind you now. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm sure it will be appearing momentarily in our committee pages. Okay. Yes, it is in housings. Thank you. Uh, so our Housing First program uh, is through partnerships with both the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Corrections. And... Um, in seven counties through the Department of Mental Health, through, and for, through both partnerships, and then an additional two counties through the Department of Corrections. Um, and then the three um, proposals that we are bringing this year is um, to bring Housing First statewide is one possibility, which would, uh, that investment would bring housing and services to 500 households, and it would expand 
uh, using our existing uh, infrastructure and staffing to those currently unserved counties. Um, other ideas that we're proposing are uh, bringing Housing First to the Northeast Kingdom, and um, another possibility is bringing it to Rutland County, where we already. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, you know. Well, if you if you go on the House General, uh, you can find it. As yes. Senator Felder said, it's there. Yeah. Sorry, that's my job for a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in Rutland County, where we do have a team already, a Housing First team working with our Department of Corrections partnership. So. Um, those are the, the possible proposals we were presenting this year, and Cheryl wanted to talk a little bit about the specifics of Housing First and how it works day to day. Yeah, I'm just, I, I don't have a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> I was just okay. trying to um, kind of share a little bit of what the day to day looks like providing services in a Housing First program, um, which looks like what we call an ACT team, which stands for Assertive Community Treatment. Um, we are running eight of those around the state. Um, and so those teams are multidisciplinary. Um, we have a shared caseload, which means everyone on the team is seeing everyone on the caseload and sharing those relationships, those connections, whatever their, you know, kind of specialty is. Um, we are focused on allowing the person receiving services to kind of drive the services that they think are relevant. Um, and, and also really focused on developing connections with the individuals, which is kind of what I call the secret sauce. Um, so two years ago, I think we were funded to expand into Bennington. Um, so we have a, an ACT team up and running in Bennington now for, for those two years, took a little bit to get it up and running. Um, and once one story out of Bennington um, is a woman, I'll call her Jane. Um, so Jane is 64, she's been, Ooh, um, she's been living outside in Bennington for six years that we know about. Sorry, I didn't expect this part. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and she, a lot of people know who she is. She's kind of a fixture, which to me sounds like that's just Jane. She's homeless. Um, so we met Jane. She didn't always want to talk to us. Um, you know, we couldn't always find her. It took some time and we built that connection. Oh. Can you guys? <laughs> um, next week, she's going to be in her apartment for a year. Oh, and so she is now, her story is that she is a person who uses the local library and loves to read about history. Um, she likes to listen to classical music. She likes to cook and she has recipes that she cooks from scratch and from memory that she will tell you about. Um, so I think if we move into the state, we'll have a lot more stories like this. So. And I, I just want to say, you know, we've been listening all morning to uh, talk about numbers and policies and this and that. So I, I wholeheartedly thank you for coming and bringing a story of somebody with lived experience. And um, that's to ground us all. And that's what we're talking about. Not numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And I would remind you that she's she's one of, of many hundreds that I've gotten to be part of this. Yeah. So I'd love to bring some more back to you next year. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you ready for questions? Sure. Okay, Representative Stevens has one. Uh, I just want to um, thank you for coming in, A, for making the trip. You got a nice day to drive anyway. Um, <laughs> but I just also, I've been, Pathways in its forms, in its, both in its pilot form and then as, as an SSA, has come through our committee looking for support over the years and um, facts and figures that you've provided over the years, which are available about the differences in, in the saving, um, which is kind of a weird way to look at it, or it's a comparative savings to say, oh, it's eight, how many thousands of dollars a month for an emergency room bed versus how many hundreds of dollars it might be to house somebody um, through, through a Housing First program. So I just, um, and I it just, the, the thing that stood out always is the relationships that you build between the clients, your, yourselves, the clients, and people who provide the housing. And so now that you're in Bennington, given that we're in a housing crisis, what has your experience been in terms of building those relationships with landlords who are willing to take on clients who may or may not be easy to deal with, 
And, and how do you develop that kind of relationship with them? Yeah, we have um, a housing team. So that's really kind of their, you know, when I say it's a multidisciplinary team, their discipline is the housing. They're really developing the relationships with landlords, with homeowners, kind of in the same way that the service team is developing relationships with the service participants. So we kind of, I always describe it as like curating those relationships with the landlords um, and, I don't know, involving them in our mission. Talk, you know, some of these folks don't look great on paper, right? So just telling a different story, right? They're, they're going to come with us. They're going to, you know, make changes, make growth. Um, you can be part of that. These are the ways we're going to respond when things don't go well. Um, we're looking at, you know, connecting the landlord really with resources like VHIP, like the Landlord Relief Fund and, and helping them navigate those systems. Um, we have a little bit of capacity to jump in ourselves when those things happen, not a lot, but, um, or, you know, helping the tenants navigate, um, say, hop grant funding through the community actions when, when they run up against, they're getting behind on their rent or they can't pay their utilities. Um, and so really kind of selling that package and that mission to the landlords and staying involved, not just like, you know, lease up and we don't hear from you again, right? They're, they're, we want to make them be part of our team as much as we can. Um, uh, Representative Garifano, but I just want to ask, ask just a, a quick question. So are the folks that um, you support, are they um, folks that are um, in the coordinated entry they um, are. Yep. database? So they're, they're, you're part of that system. Uh, with the exception of the, um, our Department of Corrections. Corrections, yeah. They're on the referral process, but um, the majority otherwise are coming through coordinated entry. Yes. Thank you. Representative Garifano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for your work um, and for being here. Uh, I'm wondering how long do the service participants have access to your services? Is it time? Right. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. So when we're talking about the three-legged stool and the supportive services, this is one avenue for people to receive supportive services. And I think that... Um, you know, uh, if you have a chance to look at the graphic that's uh, on the website, it um, seems like a pretty cost-effective way <laughs> um, to do that, for sure. Um, one question that I have is, like, you know, we're talking about, um, we hear all the time about staffing shortages and workforce and stuff, and, you, you know, you've made a, a bold proposal. Do you feel like you would be able to recruit the staff that are necessary to carry out the proposal? I, I think we have been uh, very effective in building teams as the teams have grown into new communities and um, we have worked um, very hard, you know, a very mission driven organization, um, value very much the lived experience of our staff. And I think, you know, our staff retention has been strong. Yeah, I think our staff retention is like 2.7, something like that. There's also another figure sort of comparative DAs and what their understaffing number is. And I don't know the numbers offhand, but I know that, that ours are better. Uh, <laughs> so it just speaks to, I think, probably uh, like the team aspect um, and just the culture that we're trying to, to maintain and create. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, rep represent. Yeah, just that one. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, thank you. It, it comes out like oh. reverse sometimes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So the the, uh, the folks that I've talked, spoken with who've been through Pathways have been seen it as life-changing. Um, and but that's, you know, a couple of individuals I've spoken to. Can you talk about your success rate generally? I mean, so I have numbers in terms of, you know, our all-time housing retention rate for Housing First clients is 86%. Um, have uh, ended the cycle of homelessness for, you know, 873 Vermonters. So I think over time, this program has proven uh, widely that it's very successful. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, so, I was looking yeah. for the 86 number. Mm -hmm. I knew it was like 85-ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Right. Thank you so much. And um, again, as Representative Stevens said, thank you for traveling up on this day. And, uh, you know, it's nice to end this session talking about people and talking about the success that you've had mm -hmm. in this model in supporting people. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. Thank you. Okay, Ron, we're done. <laughs> <laughs>